I heard something funny. The EU needs to flatten the curve. Hmm. So they're limiting electricity, which is what? Yeah, and then when I heard them say they were flattening the curve by doing this, I'm like, oh, so that whole thing was like training people. And then when you look at how things are going with, you know, the cult and how they follow the media, it's like, yeah, people are trained. They are. And then I started thinking about this. I'm like, if they're reusing this terminology in a new way to reduce energy, this was completely predicted by tons of people that the next move was going to be locking down for climate change. And lo and behold, we're getting something akin to that. Surprise, surprise, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the rat hope experiment. They put us in the cylinder. We swam and struggled. They took us out, dried us off, put it back in. Now they expect us to swim twice as long. I think, I think it's going to get a whole lot worse. The only difference between the rat hope experiment and what we're going through is that we have an election coming up and we might get new leaders who say no to all of this. So it should be interesting. So we're going to talk about that, plus the riots and protests that are erupting because of the energy crisis. California facing rolling blackouts. Well, good for them. Gavin Newsom was seen wearing a sweater amid a record heat wave. And a lot of people were like, what is he doing? Yeah, he's probably blasting the AC while telling you to suffer. Ain't that how it works? And then we have this uh, story. AOC gave an interview where she said she doesn't know if she'll be alive by September. Now, of course, she gave the interview a little while ago. So I don't know why she thought by now she'd be dead. I'm glad she's not. You know, I hope she lives a long and prosperous life. But I, I have to wonder first, does she have cancer? And then I thought, oh, she's talking about like civil war or something. Ah, drink. Yeah, she's talking about something like that, I guess. Patriarchy and how people hate women of color. And then she thought she'd be dead by now. So either they're completely overreacting or you look at everything that's going on. And it's kind of falling apart. So we're going to talk about that and more. Before we get started, my friends, head over to eatrightandfeelwell.com to pick up your Keto Elevate Powder from Biotrust. 51% off if you go there today. This is C8 MCT oil powder that's medium chain triglyceride. If you are wondering how I shed all of this weight over the past year, and I did. I was looking at a video from January, and I was like, wow, I lost a lot of weight. Um, I've been doing keto. Cut out most sugars. Did, doing like a modified low-carb thing now, but this stuff really does help. I load it into my coffee. Go to eatrightandfeelwell.com. You'll get a 60-day money money-back guarantee. Keto Elevate provides your body only C8, the most ketogenic MCT. Five grams of the highly sought after MCT C8 per scoop. Keto Elevate, personally, it is my favorite medium chain triglyceride powder on the market today. You'll get free shipping on every order. And for every, for every order today, Biotrust donates a nutritious meal to a hungry child in your honor through their partnership with NoKidHungry.org. To date, Biotrust has provided over 5 million meals to hungry kids. Please help them hit their goal of 6 million meals this year. You'll get free VIP live health and fitness coaching from Biotrust's team of expert nutrition and health coaches for life with every order and their free e-report, the top 14 ketogenic foods with every order. Again, eatrightandfeelwell.com. Thank you very much, uh, much, Biotrust, for supporting us. And don't forget to head over to timcast.com. Become a member to support us directly. And we're going to have a members-only uncensored show coming up at 11 p.m. tonight. You don't want to miss it. They're good fun. And I also recommend checking out the Cast Castle vlog starring Ian Crossland for president. Oh, holler. It's, uh, it's loaded with jokes. It's the longest one we've done yet. It's one of the funniest. My favorite bit was the Roberto Jr. bit with James Lindsay. Check that one out. Smash the like button. Subscribe to this channel. Share the show with your friends. Joining us to talk about all of this is Amala Epinobi. Did I get it? You Did got it I right. I got it. You got it totally right. I was right. like, I'm going to ruin You're one of the first people to actually get my name right on the first try. Dude. I was worried. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> now I feel good. The K is silent. The, the K, K is, silent. is silent. That's the tricky part. <laughs> Who are you? I am Amla Epinobi, 22 years old. I'm currently working over at PragerU as a personality, whatever that means. You guys can decide whether or not I actually have one. Talent, uh, yes. And <laughs> I am a recent radical leftist who sort of left the left and am on sort of the other side of things now. Yeah. If you want, you can move that mic around with you and just keep it like about this aiming right at your face. Beautiful. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Momentous. Beautiful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, Hannah Claire. Hi. We also have Hannah Claire. Hannah Claire <laughs> how, how are you? I never know what we're, to talk. We're, I'm just we're, we're having. Uh, you want to check the audio? <laughs> yeah, we're checking the audio right now. So no worries. Just uh, what happened was the digital gain was erased. Oh yeah. So that's why those audio yeah. problems. Digital gain. Yeah. Digital gain. It's like a, it's it's like a band name. I feel like go. I work on a spaceship sometimes. I know. No right? idea what any of this means. Uh -huh, it's exciting. Tell me yeah. about yourself. Well, hey, Claire. Hi. Yeah, I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. It's a super cool news site. I think everyone should check it out every day. What kind of things do you write? 
Uh, I write all kinds of things. I was talking about Michigan's uh, abortion ban today mm. or the judge's ruling on their abortion law. I wrote about Vladimir Putin earlier today. Always interesting. Uh, yeah, we cover a lot of stuff, lots of science, lots of policy. And I, again, highly recommend TimCast.com to absolutely everyone. There you go. All right. Well, hey, I'm Ian Crossland. Good to see you guys. Amala, great to meet you. Good uh, to be here. And I just want to remind you, check out Cast Castle. It's it's really hot. Go to TimCast.com. Sign up if you want to see the episode from yesterday. I'm very uh, pleased with my work and the work of the cast. People are, their acting skills are improved. I mean, you can tell it's like we're rising up. It's getting hot. It's getting good. <laughs> and the, the text coming together, too. It's turning into a real TV show. And crush that like button. Get ready. That's right. I'm very excited for all this new stuff coming out. We're going to be adjusting the audio as we go on the fly like we do. I'm stoked to get in today's stories, though, if we're ready to go. Are we ready? All right. Check Let's out this it. first story from TimCast.com. EU to impose mandatory electricity cuts to flatten the curve, reduced pe- reduce peak energy demands. Hmm. European Commission had announces Russian price caps as Putin threatens to cut Europe off from all energy deliveries. The European Union has announced plans for mandatory electricity rationing with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen telling reporters the EU must flatten the curve of peak energy prices. Her announcement highlighted a five point plan the EU is preparing to enact to address local energy markets. Europe has faced an energy crisis following Russia cutting off supplies of natural gas. The funny thing is. Russia is now selling gas to China, who is driving it all the way back to Europe and crank, you know, cranking up the cost. Mm-hmm. And now people are looking at like 500 percent energy increases. Italy, you've got bars and restaurants with candles. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you look over at California and they're doing the exact same thing, mm-hmm. it kind of feels like what's happening there is going to happen here. Mm-hmm. And we're just a little bit behind. But I know, Amala, you live in California, right? How's yeah. that? Been? Unfortunately, I do live in Los Angeles. So last night I was chilling in my apartment and got a notification that says, you know, due to our overwhelmed electrical grid, your electricity might go out at any moment. And you're going to have to deal with that for an hour or two. We'll rotate it across, rotate it across our different circuits. And uh, welcome to the new world order here. Mm. But yeah. it didn't, your power didn't go it out? It didn't end up going out. But uh, I guess they're putting out warnings that through this continuous heat wave that we're going through right now that there's a very good possibility that it's going to happen and in other regions of california they're doing those rotating brownouts yeah Ooh, did you, I, you saw you saw gavin newsom though right yes he's wearing did. the felice sweater wow. that was he's cold, awesome he's cold. <laughs> cool. yeah he's cold okay maybe he's like a you know it could be that he's is a lizard person you know mm-hmm. and then I'm it's like blooded. it may be hot but yes <laughs> it still needs to I like that he's got like really crazy down. tattoos of late yeah. he has to hide yeah. that yeah. <laughs> he, he rips his sleeves off and yeah. he's just got sleeves Scale. yeah so it's exactly. basically after 4 p.m i heard gavin doing a, did a video maybe this is the video you're referencing after mm-hmm. 4 p.m that's like hot time that's like peak peak electricity you turn off your what everything except for your large appliances yeah they're saying basically try not to use ac if you can help it cool your house or your apartment beforehand don't turn on any larger or major appliances anything like that and certainly don't charge your electric cars even though we're going to start banning gas vehicles in the coming years have you heard of passive cooling you ever studied any of that stuff no they they make like these uh i don't know if they're made out of wood or out of cork and then they'll Mm -hmm. like make all these little like cuts through the cork and then you just pour water into the cork and then through it only works in really dry environments okay but through um i don't know what evaporation the, yeah evaporation it cools down the room by like it 10 absorbs to 15 the degrees. water absorbs the heat from the atmosphere to huh. it'll get you from like gas. 105 to 90 maybe you know it's for desperate hot dry climates does this fit in a studio apartment is Definitely. the question yeah it's a <laughs> okay. little box you could make one, probably make one from cardboard We're i don't start even know they have the creative low low energy evaporation uh air conditioners you, you fill them with water and then it basically you yep. Know. Recently just bought one of those, although I don't know after 4 p.m. if we can even have those on. <laughs> you know, I, here's a question. Why don't you leave Los Angeles? Oh, you're getting into tricky territory here. So I do work for PragerU. We're headquartered in oh, Los Angeles. It's Dennis's fault. We're uh-huh. there. You know, Dennis, <laughs> who you had on the show, he's like, I am not leaving California. He's like, I'm I'm perfectly fine being in California. And I get it. He's uh, also wearing a sweater. He's good to <laughs> <get> <laughs> go. Yeah. Dennis is chilling. Dennis is chilling. And yeah, you know, I will say that being in the heart of all the problems does really get you invigorated every day to be in the fight. You know, when you're walking out of your apartment and a homeless man screams obscenities at you, you're ready to work every mm-hmm. single day. Yeah. day that's fair <laughs> you, have to like, you have to learn how to, you, you got to learn self-defense mm-hmm. yeah you've also got to learn you, you know uh tactical poop cleanup mm-hmm. you know i'm you never like know if you're gonna step in it i'm 120 <laughs> pounds soaking wet so uh self-defense is something i need to work on 100 mm-hmm. percent. yeah jujitsu yeah where were you before la florida 
Oh, oh what? Yeah. Why did yeah. you do that? You know what? <laughs> I like to think I thought it through. <laughs> it was a fantastic opportunity. I love my job so much, so it's totally worth it. Don't get me wrong. But leaving the Freedom State of Florida to go to LA, which has just been disintegrating in front of my eyes, has been an interesting you're experience. You're on the front lines. You on know? the front lines. You left the comfort. Mm. I'm just yep. imagining you. Yep. You're like, you're at home in Florida, and you tell your family, and you like salute them, and you're like, I'm going to the front line. Yeah. You're like, don't. You're crazy. And I'm going. <laughs> and then you go to California, where it's <laughs> really bad. Which it's, it's hilarious because my mom is a super radical left-leaning person so she would love to have switched from Florida to move over to Los Angeles and we've sort of taken our opposite path. Your mom is radical left? Because you yeah. said you were too, right? I was too, yeah. So did you appreciate Florida while you were there? Or were no. you like, this place is awful? It's like, I hate this place. Did you, did, did you get like hit in the head with a turtle shell or something and it just knocked sense into you or no, what happened? you know what? So I grew up, my mom works for the political left. Hi mom, she's not watching, but hi mom. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not watching. Uh, so I grew up with her influence and I, I was constantly told about the oppression that I was gonna face living in America. She happens to be white, so she was telling me about like, you're, oh. you know, you're black. It's gonna be a little bit difficult for you. Things are gonna be hard. And I totally fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Graduated high school, started working as a youth organizer and door knocking wow. and telling people who they needed to vote for. I worked on the Andrew Gillum campaign in Oof. Florida. Oof. Yeah, we all know how that turned out. Like, <laughs> luckily, I, my efforts went unnoticed on that. And uh, eventually just recognized so much hypocrisy that I had to leave and started looking at other views. What made you realize, like, what was the moment that you realize something yeah so I grew up with my white family and I was constantly going to work and hearing about how awful white people were and I, there were several instances where it was just the most blatant racist rhetoric you could hear regarding somebody all towards white people and I would go and work on these projects and then go home to my white family that had taken care of me my entire life and I eventually confronted one of the VPs at the organization and said I don't get it, man. We're, we said we're tolerant. We said we're anti-racist. We're literally working on these like critical race theory initiatives. And he basically told me, you don't know how oppressed you are. And that's not my fault. So, so it's like half your family black, half your family white? Yes. I wonder, because I, I, I have a similar experience. I come from a mixed, mixed race family. So mm -hmm. I'm, a quarter, I'm, I'm a quarter Asian. And my experience was, was, was similar in that I go out and I hear these lefties saying things like white people are bad. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Like, I got white family right. and not white family, and I'm pretty sure you're full of shh, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, ish, yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> this, this, and then what I end up actually seeing growing up is the policies they put in place they claim help help racism actually just end up hurting my family, and my family was the epitome of like opposing racism. Right. A hundred percent. I went through the exact same experience. I actually grew up in a really rural, conservative, small town. Never truly experienced an ounce of racism in my life, but was so dedicated to the idea that I was oppressed in this country that I like fought people about it. And I, I, I basically labeled myself as a victim and went around the world telling everybody wow. about how victimized I was. But so, so when you go to your family and you're like, hey, mm -hmm. I don't believe this stuff because like, you know, we're, we're a mixed family and clearly the white people in my family are good people. This is not true. Yeah, well, so my mom and dad got divorced when I was six. So I was basically just with my mother's influence. And I went to her and I was like, hey mom, I think I might be a little conservative. And oh, no. she hated it. And we went through. <laughs> What's we, the liberal equivalent of sprinkling you with holy water? Yeah, exactly. like, I need to help you. She's like, what can I do to stop this from happening? Because I was like her little protege in a, in a lot of ways working at the same organization she was working oh, wow. for. So, you know, her her, her head blew through the roof and we went through months of just contentious arguments over all these different subject matters and eventually she was like, okay, this is my daughter. I think she's pretty strong-willed about what she believes right now and I'm just gonna leave it alone. Maybe we don't talk politics. Yeah, I went through something similar with my mom and I realized after like five or six years uh, that it was more about the tone that we were communicating. It was more about, mm -hmm. you know, less about trying to be right mm -hmm. or just listening. But right. Ian, Ian Red pulled his mom. <clears throat> yeah, but oh, it took 12 years and it was like, we almost, our relationship almost ended and she got mm -hmm really sick from stress mm -hmm. like it was horrible when yeah. you go at it and you're like obsessed with trying to convince someone they can get really really ill it can really right. hurt people so right. the best is just to exist and listen and the cult you know, the, yeah. the, the, the cult is scary mm. uh, I agree yeah, yeah. I, I realized that just through living my life with my values I think it would sort of influence her a little bit like she's now come around and said you know what I'm I think I'm comfortable being friends with people who are conservative huh. which for her, it's a big, great. big step. I mean, when I say she's radical leftist, I mean as far left as you could possibly be. So yeah. But wow. like authoritarian or libertarian? Mm, the Probably authoritarian. Authoritarian. Crazy. authoritarian. Yeah. Cause like the libertarian left in my opinion doesn't really exist. Like mm -hmm. they do, 
But it's such an impossible political standard that most people on the left abandon it. Right. But then claim their libertarian left to try and win win votes so that they can then enslave you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, with all the policing you want to do of people's speech and how they act and what they do, it's, it's hard not to be authoritarian in that sense. Do, do you know political compass memes? There's like a couple different pages. Mm, yeah. Oh, is it like the little test that you take that puts yeah, it in the chart? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. There's a, the memes are hilarious. And it's like one of the one of the one place on the internet where they actually understand what the political compass actually means. And you'll actually see like the left and the right arguing with each other, but mm -hmm. laughing at these jokes. And I did a I did a, a mini rant once where I said, woke people are not libertarian left. Every single time people come out and talk about Antifa or something, they claim it's a libertarian left. And I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, it is not libertarian to go around bashing people over the skull, demanding they live the way they want you to live. That's authoritarian left. Libertarian left is like hippies living on a farm right. being like, you want to share this watermelon with me, dude? Mm -hmm. The problem is supporting that is extremely difficult and it doesn't scale, scale very well. But the political compass memes people were like, Tim is correct. And they, they put my face on the liberal left quadrant arguing why Antifa and woke people are not libertarian left. And everybody agreed. Amazing. Like all these different people were like, yeah, that's that's literally like woke people are authoritarian commie socialist types. Mm -hmm. Right. As soon as you start trying to impose your worldview on anybody, you can't call yourself a libertarian. Right. That's you why really it was really can't. funny when... Um, was it Jorgensen, the libertarian candidate said? Joe Jorgensen. Yeah, Joe Jorgensen said, it's not enough to not be racist, we must be actively anti-racist. Yeah. So what is, what I, but I was like, the libertarian candidate telling people what they must do is deliciously huh. ironic. What is the libertarian version of wokeness? Well, it's wokeness is woke. ideological. Yeah. So there's, there's no, there's no lib, the liber, uh, uh, if you were woke and you were libertarian, you'd say something like, you know, I think, you know, critical race theory and these things are good. How can we, uh, you know, work with each other on, on mm -hmm. trying to implement what I agree with? And then they say, I disagree with you. And it's like, oh, okay, well, we disagree. Let's figure out how to live together. See, I, I totally get right. along with those people. Mm -hmm. I met I met a communist guy. He, he, you know, I was in Berkeley. He denounced Antifa. He said, the violence is wrong. They shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. He's like, true communism would be us living together, working together. And I was like, oh, we're friends. I was like, bro, you can be a communist, I don't care, as long as you're not bashing people over the skull, you know? And it really is as simple as that. And they yeah. think we're, we're far worse than that. They, they make us out to be these horrible villains. But really, I'm like, you can believe whatever you want to believe. Just please don't come into my territory and impose it on me. Right. But and that's it, how a lot of woke ideology works. It right. needs compliance and it needs you to agree to be a part of it. If anyone questions it, then their system is broken. Yep. And that's unacceptable. That's what I love about like, this weird world where the mainstream corporate press calls every single person far right or right wing. And it's like, it's just so weird that every single ideological viewpoint is right wing, like mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. If you're a communist and you're woke, you're left. But if you're a communist and you're not woke, you're far right. Yep. Hmm. If you're a socialist and you're anti-corporate, you're far right. Jimmy Dore, who's like a socialist, is, is right wing. That, that that one blew my mind. I'm like, okay, y'all jump. Look, you want to come at me and say Tim Pool's right wing or whatever, I'll bet you can make an argument about center right or something, mm -hmm. even though I'm like in the middle. But Jimmy Dore, he's like universal health care and like all these other left policies. But then he goes, the Democrats and the Republicans are corporatists who are selling you out. And they're like, nah, he's far right. Right, but they just move the center to a place where they're like, look, all the way over there is extreme far right, whereas it wouldn't have been, you know, a decade ago, two decades ago. Mm -hmm. We just migrated it so far that we don't understand where the middle we, is at all. We just got to ignore them. Yeah, you I was know? thinking yeah, that. I love the that buzzwords, kind of, kind of let the buzzwords flow through you. The alt, the left, the right, the the, the authoritarian, the libertarian. Like, the, you don't fall into a group. Like, we're not putting you in a right. in a in a holding cell right now because of what label we slapped on your chest. It doesn't, that stuff's not relevant in humanity. Jimmy's a great example of that because he talks so much, you see the intricacies of, of who he is mm -hmm. and he doesn't, he's way all over the place as he believes what he believes. Right. Jimmy is left. I just think we have to ignore what the cult thinks because the woke cult is not left or right. Like the, this, this is what I was saying. People, don't, some people don't, don't agree, but I'm like, <clears throat> sterilizing your kids is not a left wing or right wing position. It is of the left right now, but the left is like, it, it, it's, it's it, it, usually a reference to revolutionary or economically flat systems, communism, for instance, mm -hmm. the furthest left you go on the political compass, whereas right is laissez-faire capitalism. That's the, that's the economic scale. Yeah, I think Jimmy is a bit revolutionary. He's got that revolutionary state of mind, but I also, I can tell that he appreciates uh, like the state when it functions properly. He likes that kind of stuff and he's willing to but, use the state to you know, accommodate people. 
This is, this is, and, and that's more authoritarian versus libertarian, the state versus, you know, no state. And the, the thing that always confused me when it was, is when they say, like, laissez-faire capitalists are far right and so are Nazis. And I'm like, but they completely disagree on, like, everything. How does right. that make sense? What does that even mean? And they say things like, they, they, they're, they're always trying to redefine what left and right is in order to justify why you are not left or whatever. So I'm just like. Yeah, we got to be careful about putting people them. in camps. That's what that is, is the them. first step on the path to putting people in camps is giving them labels well, and putting well, them in a consciousness yeah, box. When it comes to, I think cult is often a good word. I know it's a strong word, but it's a good word because as soon as you start to deviate on even one single issue, they throw you out and label you as something. And language is so powerful for the woke left in particular, the way they manipulate it, the way they utilize it in order to uh, put people in certain groups groups and label them and as soon as we go you know i'm not going to accept the label and i'm not going to take that i think it's when we start changing the game a little bit you know what, what's interesting is i think it's like the the snowball effect the, the snowball rolling down a hill mm -hmm. so i'd imagine for you as for like a lot of people who start questioning wokeness you probably said something small like hey i kind of don't agree with you on the white people thing and then they immediately start shoving you as hard as they could out yep that's exactly what happened. I had, so I'll tell a quick little story. I was working on a project called the Groveland Four back in Florida, and it was about these four black men had been wrongfully accused of sexual assault. And there was a documentary that we were showing, and I was trying to get all these college and high school kids to come and say, you know, this is America. This is what they do to black people. They shove them through the criminal justice system, even when they have nothing. And in the background, Brett Kavanaugh gets accused of sexual assault, and that whole firestorm starts happening. And I'm working on this project, watching Brett Kavanaugh just completely break down on camera and I brought it to my boss and I said you know why are we treating these two situations differently why is he completely just getting obliterated by the media and by the work that we're doing here yet when these four black men get wrongfully accused we're giving them all the grace in the world and he said well he's a white man and I don't care and he clearly is the frat boy type so he did it and he should hang wow yeah it just when I tell you the most dramatic rhetoric you could possibly hear, I was hearing day in and day out. I don't know how I didn't leave sooner, but yeah. eventually it was just, you can't stand it. I kind of feel like the left hates mixed race people, like woke people. The, like their, their perspective is, I, I've experienced this personally where they're like, we should have uh, segregated spaces, right? Mm -hmm. the, the POC and the non-POC. And then, you know, if you walk up to them and you're like, what if I'm both? They're like, get out because then you're still white. And in, in your story, what, what I'm imagining is, like you've got white family. Yeah. Him saying he's white, I don't care, let him hang. It's like, yo, you realize like when people say that stuff to me, I'm like imagining my family, I'm like, I don't like that. Right. Like you're, you're talking about my family too. Which was interesting because I had conservative people in my family who are sort of like the Fox News conservatives watching that all the time. And then I had my mom who was totally on board of you know, F white people. And I am I just happen to be a white ally, but also I'm part of the problem. So my brain was just going crazy all throughout my childhood. Did you feel like she owed you an explanation? Did it like hurt your sense of identity? You know, I, I just have conversations with her now and say, you know, in the future, maybe we don't do this to children. Maybe we yeah. don't teach them that they're victims <laughs> from like the age of eight years old and, and you know, tell them that there's some boogeyman out to get them, but he's invisible uh, and, and see how that goes. And how did other people in your community react when you were like, I don't know that I totally get behind all these beliefs anymore. I was completely just ousted from yeah. the organization, gone, left, never talked to again. And of course, later, I about a year or so later, I started making videos and, and those sort of blew up and just people were pissed. <laughs> one, one story I talk about uh, every so often is that during Occupy Wall Street, there was this dude, uh, it was a white dude and a black dude. And uh, black dude was like, I'm gonna run across the street to go to the bathroom. And the white dude, they were friends. He was mm -hmm. like, oh, hey, would you grab me a cheeseburger when you're over there? And the black dude went off and he was like, excuse me? And he was, and he was like, Oh, can you grab me a cheeseburger when you're over there? I'll give you money. And the black dude just went off on him, started yelling at him. And then I asked him later, what happened? And then he, he said, do you see how racist that was? And then I was like, he asked you to get him a cheeseburger? And he's like, yeah, like I'm his boy, like going to get him food or something. Oh, and I was like, dude, my oh, friends ask me to grab him stuff from the store all the time. I yeah, don't, there's a phrase, you fly, I'll buy. That's what we but, used to what, say. What, what, to Taco I, Bell, what you I fly, think, I'll buy. What I think happened there was that this, this dude internalizes the racism mm -hmm. and sees exactly. everything through a lens of you're being racist towards me. So something as simple as my friend asked me to grab him food because I was already going that way turns into a racist attack on him. Yeah. You're absolutely well, right. and I think white guilt is something that 
people are introduced to at a really young age. I, I saw a friend over the weekend and she's moved to a new city and she told me that she specifically picked her yoga studio because it was in the historically black neighborhood and she liked that it was owned by a woman of color. And if that's your preference, totally cool. And then she said, I also think it's really important that they offer classes uh, for free to black people only. And I think it's better because I should be paying for it. It's okay if I have to pay and other people don't. And I was like, you, you're describing discrimination. You know that, right? But <laughs> it's, it's, you know, what am I supposed to say to ugh. someone who feel, feels like this is part of her moral duty to Yikes. the world? You but have to, the, like you were saying, kind of approach it calmly. This is what I think people who agree with us need to understand. There's no mistake. They're racist. Mm -hmm. they, they define racist in a different way, but who cares the way they, look, I'm not trying to win an argument with them over what words mean. To me, I, my base, basis for racism is that they want racial discrimination, yeah. that they believe certain races are inherently one way or another, or something like that. Whereas I'm kind of like, yo, if I went to a restaurant and they they had signs about like only serving white people, or somebody said to me that they that they that they liked a restaurant because it catered to white people and offered free food <laughs> to white people, I'd be like, that's kind of messed up. I don't yeah. like that. <laughs> and if they did the same thing for Mexicans or black people, I'd be like, that's not okay. I don't like that. That's kind of lame. And the woke. They want the segregation. Mm -hmm. yep. Like it, it's fascinating when I talk to people and tell them about how Dearborn, Michigan had the, do, do, do you see this one? The POC and the non-POC digital events they did. I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of places doing this Tons stuff. Tons of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're like, it's a good thing. And I'm like, it's a bad thing. I'm like, well, if you don't like it, you're racist. And I'm like, dude, I don't care what word you use. I don't like what you're doing and I'm just going to stay away from you. Mm. And that's the smart thing to do. I mean, you know, Ibram X. Kendi, who we all know and dislike, talks about, <laughs> you know, the, the way to fix past discrimination is present discrimination and how that lands with anybody. I just don't understand. And I think a quick thought exercise that anybody can do is to sort of look at these headlines and what these woke people are doing and swap out people of color or black or Hispanic for, for any other race and, and see how you feel about it. See if it's truly racist. And it always is. Yeah. It always is. Yeah, it's crazy. I think part of it is people feel like they are um, they are doing the right thing by making things by overcompensating. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. by saying like, oh, well, we'll we'll pay more now because at the time you were wronged, and I think we forget that we can acknowledge that past wrongs were committed without needing to, you know push a bunch of other people down in order to make this unstable system we're trying to build up on. It doesn't make any sense. Right? Isn't it funny though how there's an overlap between these people? They're the same people who support war with Ukraine. They're the same people who think everybody should bend the knee to vaccine mandates. Mm -hmm. Like what, what's what's up with that? I think it's because, you know, I was thinking about, the, the, I saw these memes about how the Christian right were mean and they hated people. And I'm like, yeah, that's not been my experience, you know, for the most part. But I wonder, cause, cause I know that they exist. And I, I wonder if what, what, what it really is, is that there are a group of people that, or I should say a certain amount of people tend to be zealous and mob-like. They don't actually believe anything. Mm. They just do whatever the dominant social group says yep. and they adhere to it with, with force and aggression. And at one point when, the religion, when, when this country was dominated by Christians, those people claimed to be Christians and gave them a bad name. Now that the country is moving towards secularism, these people are now the same people they've always been, but now just along with the woke, giving them a bad name and making them look like garbage. But the problem is they're the prominent ones that are pushing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's like regular people who are like on the left that think racism is bad, but the dominant voices have all become these like despicable, weird authoritarians. And I think they make it so um, such a gray area where it's like, well, you, your instincts on what is racism and what feels wrong to you is wrong. You don't have a true understanding of this because you don't have this knowledge and context that we, especially in the realm of academia, say you must understand and go through to really get. Yeah, and I think uh, another underlying factor with why they do things like the vaccine mandates and jumping into war with Ukraine, when I was working for the left, there was this constant idea of radical compassion. So you mm -hmm. identify a problem, you identify what you think would be the compassionate thing to do, and you do that to the most radical extent that you possibly can, which means hopping into war with Russia, which means mandating vaccines for everybody. If, you're, if you want people to be able to come into the United States and immigrate here, we need open borders. Everything is always the most radical form of policy they can think of you know radical compassion doesn't work in my opinion i tried I it in 2006 on internet videos it's like what would jesus do with this technology <laughs> he'd connect with everyone he could and, and ex you know spread the gospel listen to them connect with their eyes mm. and i was doing it and it became so exhausting and a lot of very weak people would would connect with me and i was like i'm not turning anyone away i'll talk to anybody and so it, it broke me 
like the, the 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 people that were busted up psychologically were infecting my mind with busted up psychology and I was becoming busted up mm-hmm. and I realized it's not sustainable this radical co- you you need to let people fix themselves you need to maybe create it's, an environment where it's easier for them some people can't be fixed but that's up to some them people, I cannot fix them right. I can only give them an opportunity to fix themselves it's coddling it's what's happening right now and that's what I recognized a lot when, when talking about being biracial in America so much as what do we need to do for you what's hard for you how can you get into school how can you get a job and you can switch out the race thing for, for gender or sexuality but that's constantly the underlying factor is how can I be a savior towards X community it's funny that I, I think there are different conspiracy theor- theorists, factions, that all will blame one group of people for their problems. So, like, you've got uh, the groups that, you know, will be like the globalists, you know, you know, the, the more Alex Jones-oriented conspiracy theory types. Not, not referring to him specifically, but you've got people who hate Jewish people and blame them for all the problems. You've got the woke who blame white people for all the problems. You've got Occupy Wall Street that blames the 1% for all their problems. It's like, if you want to figure out where you fit in, which group do you hate the most? Mm-hmm. Blame for all the problems, and you found your friends. Right. To me, it's creepy because obviously this 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 planet and society is extremely nuanced, and it's not so simple to say there's one group that's causing all the problems. There aren't. Mm-hmm. There's like there's war. There's countries. There's cultures. There are ide- ideologies within countries and within races. There's different ideologies that are attacking each other. But of course, the woke they've become uh, the corporate dominant, and they blame white people for their problems. Our minds are so simplistic. I mean, it's so weird that we've reduced ourselves down to things like race and gender, which are just things that you can see to the human eye. And then we've just decided, oh, because I can see it, that must be the rule of thumb here. And there must be one ultimate villain in every single case for every single problem. It's unbelievable how simplistic our brains work. I don't Let's, like the black and white thing because we're not black and white. Or, right. That's very obviously a wrong way to right. describe things. It's too simple. It doesn't Let, function. It, it right. is. Let's jump to this uh, good fun story we have here from the New York Post. <laughs> Kathy Griffin slammed for saying Republicans will start a civil war. The first thing I want to say Tim, is Tim, she stole your line. No, no. <laughs> first New York Post is wrong. <laughs> Hold on. New York Post, you need to issue a correction. She did not say Republicans will start a civil war. Oh. She never said that. Mm-hmm. That is defamation and slander of our good friend, Kathy Griffin. <laughs> Kathy. What she said was, if you don't want a civil war, vote for Democrats in November. If you do want civil war, vote Republican. She did not say in any capacity the Republicans would start one. In fact, she didn't She didn't in any way imply either. Uh, well, she didn't state either side would, but she implied Democrats would. Mm-hmm. Let's do some basic logic real quick. If you vote for Democrats, they win. There won't be a civil war. That means Republicans will do nothing. If you vote for Republicans and they win, and she says there will be a civil war in that capacity, well, Republicans aren't going to start a civil war after winning Who's legitimate power. Fighting, yeah. The Democrats would have to start fighting with them. Otherwise, they're in power. She's actually implying Democrats will start a civil war. Many people pointed this out. She's basically issuing a threat. Yep. If you don't vote for us, we are going to war. Well. And Twitter's cool with it. They're civil war, it drink. Yeah, leave it up. <laughs> this is the second one. She did the cut the the he- Trump head I think it's and it held that bloody head. This is kind of another weird, like, uh, visceral statement it's just shock value i think after that trump head thing she should just went you know what no more inter- no more internet for me yeah i think i'm done Siraj, this. I think where's I the list it. yeah take her phone away seriously i saw her try to work it back and say you know if the democrats are in power they'll be able to hold off the, the maga republicans from starting some sort of war that's what i meant by the tweet but i don't think but that why, landed well, so here, so she's implying that the, the the maga republicans get elected are handed the keys to the castle and then they're gonna go ah! and just start running around and smashing things. Makes no sense. They have legitimate power. They've won an election. They're Why cr- would they do anything like that? They're all crazy white people, Tim. We don't no, know what they're yeah. gonna do. Yeah, we don't exactly. know what white people are. Capable I wonder, well, of. that's true. But then you end up with people like Tim Scott. They act like doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. I no. wonder how much of of Kathy is getting taken out of context because it's. It, did she say this verbally or was this in text? It's a this tweet. Is a tweet. All tweet. All she's tweet. a comedian. Text. Mm-hmm. Your your jokes don't always translate to text. Oh, come on. I don't mm-hmm. think this is a joke. I yeah. mean. It does seem like a cry for attention. She did have that reality TV show that was like uh, My Life as a D-List Celebrity oh, or she something. Did? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This well, is way back in the day. She's a D-List Celebrity, so uh, I never yeah. heard of it. So, herself. you know, she really does need people to notice her whenever whenever possible. So I feel like, again, she's somewhat political openly a lot of the time, but also, you know, uh, she uh, has uh, to stay part of the relevant conversation. As somebody who, who's, you know, half of their tweets are completely nonsensical and hilarious. Uh, yes, I'm saying my jokes are funny. Uh, <laughs> I feel for Kathy Griffin if she's taken out of context. The only issue is she 
made, took, she took a photo of herself holding a faux severed head of Donald Trump. It's hard to get out of context. Yeah, it's... she's she's literal. <laughs> like, you know, look, I think my tweets are funny because I'm intentionally trolling and screwing around. And the fact that some people believe, so I'll tell you this, I tweeted when the left was ragging on the song we put out, I said, the success of Only Ever Wanted proves that deep down Americans crave powerful emo music, but the, glo <laughs> but the, but the globalist yeah. corporate elite are conspiring to suppress it. Right. <laughs> and they Klaus started, they started sharing here. the tweet Wait. on Reddit and other posts being like, Tim Pool literally thinks this. And I'm like, Do that I? was so overt <laughs> in its nonsense that no sane person would believe I was being telling the truth. If you were to look at what Kathy Griffin is saying, and you think she's joking, then I think you're being equally dishonest. I think this is the, this year's Democrats get out the vote campaign. Like yeah. if you don't vote for us, it's gonna end in civil war. And they want you to believe it's Republicans, but as Tim is completely right in pointing out, right. it's actually the Democrats being like, we will riot. We've been doing it for a little while here. Everyone's cool when we do it, not when any Republicans do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's kind of crazy that she can post this. It can stay up and she's going to be like, no, I'm, I'm in the right to say it. This is a get out the vote. It's all fear tactics. I mean, she seems clearly inspired by Joe Biden. We watched his last speech where he's talking about, you know, the MAGA Republicans are the threat to America. So we all have to worry about. They hate this country so long as they don't win. I think they're really just pushing fear, fear, fear. And please get out and vote for us or else. And it works. Yep. yep. It, 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 it works and you know a lot of republicans are like oh it's going to be a red tsunami and we're going to win and i'm like yeah you better operate under the, under the assumption it's going to be a blue wave and get out every single person you can because yep. i'll tell you even if you do win the likelihood the republicans you know the republican leadership will do something is low so you need to make sure the win is overwhelming mm -hmm. so that yeah look if, if if in swing states you get moderate republicans who win then they're going to jam things up and be like, no, no, now listen, you know, we gotta be, we can't play that way. We had Rick Santorum on, and you know, I, got, I respect the guy, but he was like, we can't play that game. We gotta play by the rules. And I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, I get it, play by the rules. But playing by the rules also means you subpoena them when they do something illegal. You don't say, well, you know, that's too much and too far. Well, that's what they're doing. They're going after Trump, they're going after Bannon, they're going after people on the right. They put Peter Navarro in shackles. So maybe Republicans need to win and just, you know, get some subpoenas and do some investigations. Figure out what went on with, with Crossfire Hurricane. Maybe get some accountability for Russiagate. Yeah, and I think if you are a conservative-leaning voter, it's much better to look at the tsunami after it's hit than yes. to be like, I think it's coming. I'll yes. just, I'll just right. pretend like, and then it turns out it's nothing. There, yes. there is, I think the Republican Party is prone to complacency and, you know, they think they're being forgiving. Be like, well, we're not going to follow up on any of these things. We could press charges, but, you know, we're going to be the bigger people and move on. And it's like, no, actually, you are letting the justice system fall by the wayside by being inactive and becoming complacent. Yeah, the yeah. riots of 2020 was an example of that. Yeah. Like day Insane. two, where was the National Guard? And all they said was like, well, if we, if we start prosecuting people, we'll probably get worse. Right. right. We're being mean. We're so. just reactionary and just reactive. We're like waiting for them to come to our backyard to react to them and then going, oh, well, there was no laws to protect me for this. Oh, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I get called a black pillar a lot because I'm constantly like, hey, guys, I'm I'm not convinced there's going to be a red wave. And they're like, mm. oh, I'll just let it happen. I'm like, no, you can't do that way. You need to be taking every single possible step you can. You need to be getting other people involved in voting. And I've been going back and forth with a lot of people about whether we should fight on their level. And I think the ultimate answer is that, yes, we should as far as lawfare goes. And then as far as like character goes, we need to stick by. See, that's where your conservative principles can actually come out is in your character. You don't need to do what they do. You don't need to cancel people as hard as they do, but you can fight back on the level playing ground that is supposedly There know, was a poll stuff. from the uh, Trafalgar group, I think today, that said after Biden's speech, a, a lot of independents, and I can't remember the percentage, but let's say 30% so swung and were like, this, yeah. that speech That's is like cool. <laughs> aggressive rhetoric. This is uh, inappropriate. Like this is not right. Obviously, the, you know, high percentage of Democrats thought that speech was wonderful. Mm. Lots of conservatives were like, wait, no, that's insane. But it was the independents who were like, you're losing us here, Joe Biden administration, the Demo Democratic Party. Like, this is not something that we support. I think it was like, uh, I wish I had the number in front of me, like 50% were like, it was a lot. We, yeah. over 50% yeah. were like, we are against how this presentation and the way this looks. I think in some ways, the Democrats themselves will show are showing their true colors. But I can't stress enough that I feel like the Republican Party's one of their biggest issues is that they become complacent and they're like, got in the bag, let's all just pack up and go yep. home and that's yep. how you lose. No, we need serious asymmetric, uh, what would you call it, I guess, culture warfare. Lawfare. This is a culture, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, lawfare, I'm open to being 
equal. We should be treating the law equally among all people. But if you want to win a culture war against a communist infusion or whatever the hell is happening, you need deep spiritual power. You need some sort of imbalance of power to win that. And that, I think, is internal. It's, it's meditation, consciousness, uh, listening to people, yep. being willing to cry. That comes out. The way that we communicate is so different to the way that progressives communicate. And I've, I've learned that a lot just being having worked on both sides. Their grassroots organizing endeavors are insane and they're very well run. They're they're in the communities running around, knocking doors, having conversations with people and having very emotional conversations with people. And I think that's what influences voters. Conservatives, we're not very emotional. Nope. <laughs> we don't use like a storyline in order yeah, to, to influence people. And as far as his speech, he had a, an amazing opportunity to hop up there and give a message of unity and say, you know, we can coexist. There is a way that we can unite out of this. And I want to be the president who does that. But he fumbled the ball. And at least that ball is now in our court. Yeah. I think the play was you're going to fumble. The other team's going to. But then we're going to recover it and run it in for a touch. Like it was like in, the, the speech was written as a fumble. See, I feel like it wasn't actually about unity because of the lines about the right wing. extremism. It was not. He was like under the guise of patriotism being like, look, I'm in front of Independence Hall and they've got all these great colors. And look at those Marines. And then it's like, but remember, the MAGA conservatives are the devil. And if you vote for them, you are going to set our country on fire. The emotion is a, thing. Not a uni- unifying message. The emotion thing is everything. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. The, right yes. now, the Democrats are heavily just targeting emotion emotions, hate and fear, yep. hate and fear. And I think people on the right, as you were mentioning, they're not very emotional. They don't get it. Ben Shapiro, you know, thinks he'll make a logical argument and convince convince you. But in fact, he's only speaking to people who are already logical. Mm-hmm. And people who are already logical are probably already more right leaning. Yep. So I, I know this from having done uh, street fundraising and uh, I'm canvassing where we would go and talk to people on the street way up high. They always give you these spiels. And they would be like, say this. And they were very methodic, logical. Hi, my name is this. I work for here. Here's the problem we face. Here's how you can help. Great. And of course, that stuff never works. Mm-hmm. And they don't want you to say anything else like for like legal reasons. But I was like, dude, I can get people to sign up for anything without saying a single fact. Like they're worried about you saying something factually incorrect and then giving someone, someone gives a donation and then you've got like a you know liability issue or something. And I'm like, just tug on their heartstrings. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, so the pitches I would do were often very much like, trying to make people cry. Yep. Just like tell them a story about, a, you know, talking about homeless people, telling them a story about a homeless person that no one loves. Uh, imagine what it must feel like that no one's there for you and no one loves you. And then when you finally do see someone walking down the street, they look at you with disgust and they spit on you. Mm-hmm. And then people are like feeling bad and then you, they, they donate. The best sales pitch I've ever seen was this guy selling door to door to door children's encyclopedias who was like, <laughs> yeah, I took this opportunity to be out here because my fiance's here, but you know, it's really hard and they didn't tell you that our wages would be awful and we have to buy the product first. And like, we like all have to share a van and like I have to sell these because otherwise I'm in debt to the company. And like, yep. I watched so so many people it. buy that guy's encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah. He, he might as well have been selling. I don't even know what. But yeah. if you if you go up to somebody and say, he also may know. not have had a fiance. I just want to put that on the table. No <laughs> idea. Could have been lying. The whole thing could have been a lie. The, 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 the same is true for for the right. Like if you were going to make a pitch and say, like here's here's why Democrat policy is bad. Right, Joe Biden. He's enacted these these policies such as banning fracking on public lands, which has caused a spike in speculation. Now, here's a logical reason why that's going to they don't care. They don't care. They say you're lying. They say it's fake news. Donald Trump is bad. He's evil. You need to go out and like drive emotions. Mm -hmm. Talk, you know, just create a a circumstance where you make them feel something and then point them in the direction of what what they that's what the Democrats do. They say bad stuff, bad stuff. Donald Trump, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Our best bet is like going out there, talking about the state of the economy right now, how American families are hurting, talk about this defund the police movement and how it's hurting low income minority communities, tug on the heartstrings there. And it's not a hard thing to do because it's real. It's actually happening. People are seeing it in their backyard. Parents are getting galvanized because their their students are being affected in this public schooling system that's completely failing them. If you use those emotional stories and then, you know, plug in the facts there as you need to, uh, people will get behind you. I want to pull up this tweet because uh, we, we were talking about, um, you know, like law and, and stuff came up. And I, and I was thinking about this in the context of where we're going Civil War wise. Marion Williamson was responding to a Newsweek story about Trump getting his special master, that they're going to review the document seized and she said, this is terrible news. Why is that terrible? Sticks Hexenhammer says, how sad that your witch hunt nonsense is being put on hold for due process reasons. Hmm. She responded, does the law matter to you at all or do you just think it doesn't apply to him? Now, here's the problem. Marion Williamson. I actually, I think she's a very nice, sweet lady. But this is the issue with the left. They don't care about facts. 
at all. They care about how they feel. So they ignore facts. They don't do research. And my response, the law stopped being relevant when Democrats impeached Trump over Joe Biden threatening the Ukrainian president with illegally blocking U.S. aid guarantees. Or maybe it was when they fabricated evidence to spy on Trump. The funny thing is, people like Marion Williamson don't know that happened. Mm -hmm. Telling her doesn't matter because it gives her a negative emotional response. You were wrong. Your facts are bad and you're on the wrong side. Eh, Negative emotional response. Don't want to listen to you. Get away from me. Mm -hmm. They only want sweet, comforting lies. Well, they want sweet comfort. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, they want lies. They prefer they want, lies. They look, look, look. Trust. Whether whether they intentionally say, I want lies, or yeah, the lie yeah. is what makes them feel better, right. and they request. So they're like, make me feel better. Yeah, I love that line from V for Vendetta where he says, would you prefer a lie or the truth? When when uh, he gets asked by Evie about mm-hmm. you. They want hope. Did like, you kill that man? What was the So what is the situation here? What law what is being discussed? She says there's no due pro there's there's no rule of law. So Donald Stick Trump says there is they, they seize the documents. Trump mm-hmm. says a special master should review this to make sure they're not going through private stuff they're not allowed to, Isn't like like good? privileged documents. Jeez. And she thinks you should good not have thing. due process. Well, well you should. she's she's scared that the that the appointee is gonna be somewhat on his side, that they're gonna help him out, and she's also scared of lengthening this out before he announces whether or not he's gonna run for president. So oh. if they if they have a hitter that they can use on Trump before he puts in his candidacy, they want it now. As- Right, Dude, and it's so sorry. Let me let me squeeze this okay. in real fast. It is so telling to me that they don't want it to be possible for someone to like Donald Trump's yep. perspective. That's well, and insane. He's already convicted in their minds. Like, oh, it's, for it sure, doesn't he committed a crime? We're just not totally sure what the crime is. Is mm-hmm. the logic there? So yep. why he would need due process is sort of beyond ken to them because he shouldn't. He should already be convicted. They don't yep. want anything holding this up because right. he is already you know, persona non grata enemy number one. There's no recovering from that. He doesn't deserve the law. A big mistake mm-hmm. people are making, I think, is that they're pinning a lot of social distress right now on political parties. Like, which is it the Republicans causing this chaos or is it the Democrats? But in reality, when you look at videos in like Sri Lanka or in Italy where people are rioting on the street mm-hmm. and smashing stuff and attacking cops, it's because they don't have heat. They don't have electricity. Yeah. That's what's ca- causing and going to cause civil stress in this country. It well, really doesn't matter who's in political power at that state. But everyone is going to say like, well, you know, you why you don't have the things that you need to survive because of that other party. I uh, Vladimir Putin did this interview today where he was like, yeah, Europe is sacrificing all of their people uh, to keep the uh, American globalist elite in uh, dominant power. Like he is mm. saying the exact same thing. We are all looking for wow. someone else to blame issues on. Wow. But like with all of the sanctions and energy bills are high, you can understand where that that line is now going to potentially be persuasive to at least Russians, if not other people who are like, yeah, our leadership is really messing us up here. How are we going to get over this? What is this? it, the system they don't want? I, I, I hate using the term they, it's so vague, but p- power structures don't want people to be in power, don't want people to have unlimited electricity because then they'll have more power than the government and rise up and overthrow. So they've kept mm-hmm. this in a state of slaveocracy, but that's going to cause people to rise up it's like in one of the greatest movie franchises of all time, Fast and oh, Furious. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, um, goodness. I think it, I fundamentally a wise man once said uh-huh. the, the villain in one of them, I, I'm not sure if it was five or not. He said, you know, you give the people something that they're, that, that they're scared to lose. You could take away and then you control them. Then they're your slaves. That was my thought. Yeah. So, yep. so it's basically like give them just enough. You make their lives better and then they're dependent upon you. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like it's like, you know, it's not all bad in a sense where you're making their lives a little better. But then you're also using it specifically for control. Yeah, it's like a leashing person. a Tyrannosaurus Rex and hoping it doesn't realize that it's a T-Rex and you're just a little guy. With well, a it's leash. like uh, uh, there's a, there's this famous meme where there's a big elephant with like a rope on its foot yeah, and exactly. a little a little a little, yeah. pi- a little mm-hmm. spike in the ground. Mm-hmm. And someone said, "Why won't the elephant just rip it out and and walk away?" And they said, "When the elephant was little, it struggled mm-hmm. and fought and learned that it couldn't get out. Mm-hmm. Now that it's older, it doesn't even bother trying." Mm-hmm. And on top of that, they're they're also pushing this message of you need to do this. This is the this is for the greater good. Like with this energy stuff that's happening right now, entangled in that is the climate crisis and hysteria surrounding that. So not only are you giving the government control, but you're doing it for a good cause. You're doing yes. the right thing, which is exactly what's happening in the Netherlands right now. You know, the farmers are, are up in arms about their, their livelihoods being taken away, and it is just a massive land grab from the government. But the government is saying, no, it's for climate well, change. This line flattened the curve, like COVID taught us, you yep. referenced the rat hoax, it's really Pavlov's a dog. They ring the bell, oh, we gotta flatten the curves, and everyone should fall in line and do this because mm-hmm. it's for the greater good. That's right. So the, the rat the, the rat hope experiment, mm-hmm. we've talked about it a bit before. Guy takes three rats, three cylinders, puts the rats in the cylinders, 
They swim for 15 minutes, can't get out, and then they just give up, sink, and die. Mm -hmm. Then he takes another pair of rats, set of rats, puts them in. They swim, 15 minutes or so, they give up, but this time he lifts them out, dries them off, lets them relax, then puts them back in. The second time they swam for 60 hours. Yep. So we talked about this during the COVID lockdown. Are they going to rat experiment us? You put us in lockdown, everybody starts losing their minds, and then right before it gets too bad, you stop, you let everybody go back to normal, you bring the movies yeah. back, you bring mm -hmm. the video games back, Thank the food's you. back, the pizza's back, the wings are back. And then you give everybody a little bit to relax, dry off, and then do it again, and now they'll last 60, 60 times as long. So if you went, let's put it this way, 15 minutes to 60 hours, we're talking about, what is it, like a 200, and, uh, two, uh, was it 20, what are we doing? Yeah, 20, 240 uh, times. 240 time increase. So uh, based on the fact they locked us down for what, a year? Are they now going to start pulling hard back for another couple hundred years? It doesn't need to be that much. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to translate. You only need a generation because you lock down the, the, the generation of people that are used to living well and have ac access to technology. Once they accept their fate, and say, if we just stay at it and flatten the curve, then eventually things will get better. Right. Then but they I think die. People and don't, the kids born into it will be like, this is normal. People don't do well in slavery. They never have. And they've always, there's just a history of uprising against slavery, whether it's a monarchy or a corporation or whatever. Like, I, I can't imagine that people would sit still for very long in, in that control, situation. Bro. They'll but try for sure. Mind control. In, is, there, is there like a form of soft totalitarianism where it's like you, you are somewhat enslaved, but you have all these wonderful amenities to keep you at bay and to keep you docile and you have your streaming services and you have just enough AC to keep your house cool and you know just enough to be fine in the place that you're at and without enough energy to really realize how oppressed you are. Yeah, they, to, they, they have to slowly take away from you yep. because the idea is you will own nothing and you will be happy. That's right. And, and but, but this is true, okay? That's a true statement. You will own nothing yeah. and you will be happy is true. Mm -hmm. You So we right now are not unhappy that we don't have access to flying cars and teleportation. I mean, speak for I'm, yourself. No, I know. <laughs> Some people are like, I wish I could teleport. But what I mean is, you, uh, we mentioned this a little while ago. There's a, there was a video of a 90-year-old man in like the turn of the century 20, 1900s, they recorded him. He was alive in the Civil War and they were like, what's it like with all this, you know, how was it for you growing up with all the technology now? He's like, same. Hmm. People get by, they do the work they gotta do. We got by just fine, people get by now. We are we are accustomed to the technology we have. We are not upset that we don't have technology we don't know exists. True. So if they can take it away from you and then re remove it from your thoughts or the next generation grows up without having it, they won't be unhappy because they right. won't know it existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I forget what podcast I was watching this week, but they were talking about how it's humanity's greatest strength and our greatest weakness that we can get used to anything. So there really hasn't been a lot of humans thriving in slavery, but people do get used to it. I don't know if you remember, and I'm, I'm sure Ian doesn't know, but in the Bible, the Israelites escaped slavery and they were so upset in the desert, they were like, why can't we go back to slavery? Mm -hmm. That was wow. better. At least we were fed, right? Yeah, this is a thing that happens to humans and has been happening since we yeah. became humans. Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at young people during this COVID pandemic being locked down, how quickly they were like, oh, I'm totally fine being home. Also, mm -hmm. let's work from home now. And the way our workforce has shifted subsequently, it's we Training. are very quickly. Well, and you saw, yeah. I used to see a lot of content that was mm -hmm. like, somebody asked me to get lunch before the pandemic and you're like running errands, you're doing a ton of stuff. And then after the pandemic, like you have one social interaction. You're like, I'm done for the year. I can't it's do it anymore. Much. Like yeah. they, it literally became something that people are overwhelmed yeah. by when it was actually a huge part of civilization working in community and having regular contact with other people like we are now more isolated and the pandemic just made it so we acclimated faster yeah and but we're more connected through the internet right guys i love yeah. the, <laughs> the training the, 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 the training worked but i also think it's a big marketing campaign it's a big psyop mm -hmm. so you, you do remote work i'm actually not not uh, as opposed to uh, remote work for a lot of jobs some jobs require community and 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 you know cohesion but for a lot of jobs like yeah you can work from home for a lot of this stuff now you've got people who are, I don't want to go back to work. I want to work from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good for everything that's going on, at, like reducing carbon emissions, all the climate change stuff, all the energy stuff. They put people in a position for a year. Then people get accustomed to it and then beg for it again. That's what they like. Yeah. Social, social manipulation, social yeah. engineering. And this would be, I don't want to put too much weight on the World Economic Forum, but I don't know mm. who else they're working with, but the idea that people are going into the pods, that we're creating like a race of Borg, people pod people that are people brains are hooked to the to the machine and and we're all kind of seeing each other's thoughts and working as one other, because the other the other option is total chaos and, p and uprisings of people thinking they don't have enough 
and fighting and killing and destroying. Look, look, look. I don't want everyone to be blackpilled here. Oh, okay. Mm. I want you to see this story from Bloomberg. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. yes nice. Thousands protest in Prague over energy crisis. Yep. Interesting. Demonstrators gathered to protest against the government in Prague. I think in Italy they were burning their energy bills. Mm -hmm. Is that Italy? Why? Oh, UK Ta doing the same thing. UK, take a look at this. Protests against the Indonesian government's 30% gas price hiker in full force. Watch as protesters try to break down a wall of police officers in riot gear. Oh, this is apolitical. Around. Yeah, That's this right. is bipartisan. Yeah. So what I mean to say is, you know, people won't stand for this. And I don't believe Barack Obama or Bill Gates or any of these people. They are not trustworthy people. They come to me as a young man and say, good sir, urban liberal. We have a climate crisis at hand. And I say, really? Tell me more. And they say, that's right. There's too many people. Makes sense, doesn't it? Deer get overpopulated. Birds, turkeys, pigs, they can overpopulate, right? And I'm like, yeah. And they go, well, we got a problem. We can't just kill people. So we have to work together to reduce our energy use, reuse and recycle. And I'm like, yeah, that all makes a lot of sense. And they're like, now you get to it. My private plane is waiting to my beachfront yep. property. And I'm like, well, hold on there a minute. Second. <laughs> Hold on, I sacrificed, and then you bought beachfront property in Martha's Vineyard. Mm -hmm. These people are full of it. If they really cared about this stuff, they wouldn't be doing the things they're doing. No, what I think the reality is, is that they want to preserve what they have. They probably are worried about overpopulation and political instability. But the reality is, if we can get you to sacrifice, we get to keep our private jets. Yeah. yeah. So when they try to implement these, these, these control mechanisms, it's like you mentioned, Ian. They want to control the energy you get access to because by limiting it, it makes it easier to control you. If only the wealthy elites have access to the internet or access to these, you know, you know, flying cars or whatever, they're an advantage over poor people and they can more easily control them. So now what we see is people are protesting and rising up saying, we do not agree with this. And that's what we need to see. Mm -hmm. Because if people just lay down and accept this, then you're all going to be pod people, basically sheep or chickens. Internet's kind of helped us to smash class systems. Like there used to be the elites and the plebs or the plebs, at least. In, and, and all through society, there's been better men and everybody else, you know, whatever in the Americas, there were the better men that mm -hmm. made the government. But I think people are, are not everybody, but more willing to represent themselves what Tim is saying is reminding me of the criticism of the North America Free Trade Ag Agreement. It was like, here's what we're going to do as a collective, you, a U.S., Canada, Mexico, and part of the environmental policies were like, we're going to reduce carbon and do whatever, and Mexico never reduced their uh, carbon emissions. And so it was mm -hmm. like, wait, we were, we said we were all in this together, and it was like, but why are we why are we staying in this agreement in this partnership that's not working? I feel like that's the same thing that these people are saying. Like we rely on you to protect us, and you are swearing allegiance to a system that is causing us to suffer. Like you are supposed to put our interests first. Right. They're realizing their public servants are not serving them anymore, no, and that there is a clear. I think the class divide is getting just so abundantly clear, especially through the internet and independent journalism. Like if we weren't talking about this, and and these independent journalists weren't talking about this, nobody would know that all these separate protests are happening right now. But now we're getting videos coming out and, and different people are jumping on the movements. In the Netherlands, when that started, sooner or later, France jumps in, Spain jumps in, because they all know this is going to be a collective fight. I mean, it was well, the same thing with the Freedom Convoy, right? We yep. saw it happening in Canada and people were like, oh, wait, yeah, I don't want this either. We're going to we're going to act. And you didn't see it modeled as heavily anywhere outside Canada. I mean, people right. carried out to a certain extent. But like that reminded everyone that like you don't have to lay down and conform to what's going on, especially if yeah. it's harming you. I think it's funny. I remember the Arab Spring. <laughs> You had uh, uh, people using Facebook and Twitter to organize mass protests in these Arabic nations and then, you know, overthrow their governments. Egypt mm -hmm. did it twice. And then uh, we start seeing that with Occupy Wall Street. People start organizing and protesting. Occupy, I think, got co-opted by, you know, special interests. But the ability to use social media to organize and reject these centralized control systems is extremely apparent. And now they're desperately trying to put a stop to it. Yep. They have to ban people like Alex Jones. They have to silence as many as many of these voices as possible. And they, they, they first started going through going for big names. Alex Jones, for instance, Miley Nopolis, Laura Loomer. And then they started going after the smaller accounts because they were like, hey, what, maybe we can do it that way. Go after a million small accounts that aren't big enough to make a splash if they get banned, as opposed to the big one that makes a big yep. news cycle mm -hmm. if you do ban. Mm -hmm. So that's the strategy now. Well, yeah. The other thing, obviously, is shadow banning and, you know, I was Algorithmic say, manipulation. The second benefit that I heard to them is, you know, you ban these people, and if you're saying like, oh, these they hold extreme views and they get purged, they look for an alternative, right? So, Andrew <clears throat> Tober talked about like Gab was not a politi inherently political 
uh, alternative to Twitter, except that they banned all of the extreme right wing users first. So they were like, well, we'll go to Gab. Yeah. And so that gave the platform a natural leaning, even though that wasn't how he started it. Then you can have anyone at Twitter be like, well, what are you going to do? Join that crazy extremist platform? It right. siphoned off society and made it so you can point directly where you should not go next. The internet is very powerful. I mean, like, look at China and what's happening there right now. There's protests erupting all over China because people can't get their money out of the banks, but there's no, they have such a strong hold on social media and the information that you're allowed to get out of to people that it's so hard to stage a protest. Yeah, it's it makes so me always hard. want to be like, who is getting banned first? Because whatever they're doing, maybe I don't agree with it, but I want to know because if right. they're getting purged first, just just be aware of it. Like, mm -hmm. why are they getting purged? Well, they do a lot of things. Somebody commented already that, um, you know, we've got 40,000 people listening to the show right now, concurrent viewership. We're not trending on YouTube. Mm -hmm. yep. When you search for it, you can't find it. And it's election season, so we knew this was going to happen. Yep. But uh, unsurprising. Has it always been that way with the show? Like, did you ever trend on YouTube? I can't remember. I, I think, yes. It, it, early on, we, we did trend several times, I'm pretty sure. And then all of a sudden one day, uh, I remember Timcast IRL, you couldn't search for it on Google anymore. Mm -hmm. You would take the title verbatim, put it in Google, and Facebook would come up instead. Mm -hmm. And it was just funny. And then it was after like a year or so, all of a sudden, I mentioned it on the show, the next day we reappeared in search. But they, I think it was more that they realized it was so overt, people were catching on to their suppression. Mm. Right now, I think it's funny because um, we put out a song last week, everybody knows at this point, I guess, and it was trending number 23 on YouTube, which is funny because this show gets more views mm -hmm. and it never trends. It's politics. But this is the point of, of the culture war. Putting out music is apolitical. Boy, are they really salty that we did that and succeeded at it. Mm. They're freaking out. Some are. But it was a good song, so they get that. Well, it's like overwhelming thumbs up and positive, but the, the corporate press is losing their minds. When it comes to admitting social networks, politics is kind of a risky admin. Because if you decide to let politics run on the front page of your social network, you're basically taking a political stance as a, as a social network administrator, whether you want to or not. So you, I used to put that stuff in its own bucket. Like if you want politics, you got to go look for it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to push it at you. I'm pushing, you know, letting entertainment or what and it's like that's a dirty surface level way to go but politics is really dirty too and i don't i don't think that just because someone's got the loudest voice necessarily means that everyone should be looking at it people want power well here's a question are, are left-leaning people ever trending on youtube do you guys keep up with that stuff yeah do you see stuff? yes well I, do. I don't i don't like, know about prominent uh like overtly political yeah i don't know about that mm. if yeah. you look at it it's usually music and like mr beast no okay. so yeah, every mr. single beast, time i turn on my smart tv it's on youtube and mm. it's on the young turks Every uh, time, well, it well, doesn't matter what I do. The, the, the Young maybe. Turks are, are an approved YouTube TV station. Right. Like they're, they're you get YouTube TV and they're a channel. Mm. Why are we a channel? Yeah, what the heck? What's That's going a good on idea. Here? It's a no-no. Well, they, they have 24 hour coverage, I'm pretty sure. Like they have something running on reruns on like a live stream oh, for a channel. That. So we can have a whole yeah. show where I just vamp for an hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we're getting we're, get, we're getting there. We have we have pop culture crisis three to five. Mm -hmm. We have Timcast IRL eight to ten. We got to start filling these these time slots with other shows. Right. We're going to be launching the conspiracy show with Shane Cashman, which is like a call in show. It's not going to be live though, but we could air it in a time slot and then maybe eventually get a twenty four hour rolling live stream. Does That's Young cool. Turks do a website where you pay ten bucks a month and get their yeah. stuff? Yep. Oh, okay. So they're doing they know it for both. a long time. Interesting. I think we have more. I think we're bigger than they are, to be honest. I'm not sure. <clears throat> I see a lot of left leaning, not always like a politician or a commenter, but mm -hmm. I do see a lot of presentation of, you know, it seems like fun internet content, right? Yep. Like rank all these people for but also, like best fashion. But it's always, mm -hmm. you know, you have to look at the people. They have certain ideologies. They'll talk about how they don't like certain things. And it's never from the conservative perspective. It's always, and I think that's partially because YouTube has flagged let's say left-leaning culture as mainstream culture. Yeah. It's moving us towards a left-leaning spectrum when we know that's not actually accurate for most of America. Exactly, that is why I started making videos. I was just sort of a passive user of social media, but then I started realizing how they curate the content based on your demographics and what they know about you. And I started getting all this stuff about Black Lives Matter and the mm -hmm. black struggle and the feminist struggle. And I thought, is there nobody to counteract this mm -hmm. on social media? And of course they are, but they're just getting throttled left right. and right. Yeah. yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Oh man, I want, I'm, I'm going to save something for uh, the next 17, 20 minutes to give a quick update on, on the on the on the uh, culture war issues. So I'll save it. But uh, yeah, the the issue with the uh, with Facebook and Twitter is algorithmic. Mm -hmm. And early on, what happened was people who ran these big tech companies were naturally left leaning, 
they think they're the majority, so they would ban what they thought was not normal. It's, it's literally exemplified in that meme where it's like the left and the right and Bernie Sanders is placed in the middle and there's nothing on the left. And it's like, watch this space. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. like, it's like, it's like, dude, Bernie Sanders literally wants uh, the people to own percentages of corporations. That's socialist, like overtly. If you think he's a centrist, you're in a cult, but they do. They think I'm I'm a middle of the road person, mm -hmm. and and Bernie Sanders is in the middle of the road. It's like, no, no, he's not. Yeah, by sure. no metric, not by left and right uh, progressive st like, like cultural standards, and not by economic standards. He's left. He's fairly far left, actually. Yeah, but they think they're in the middle, so they ban you. Well, it's the tech. You're you're totally right. It's tech executives as well as the area that they're in, right? So if we think of Hollywood and Silicon Valley as similar areas, mm -hmm. both those industries are dominated by people who think, who are already naturally left-leaning. And then they walk outside and their kids have friends at school who aren't in the industry. And they're also left-leaning and then it gets reinforced over and over again. It's why I'm so interested in businesses like uh, Daily Wire setting up in, in Tennessee, like businesses that want to produce content, especially now that the internet gives us that flexibility, yep. who settle in places that are not these centralized you know, echo chambers. They're physical echo chambers where people all sort of think the same thing. I would like to bring you to the world of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Oh. In this tweet from Ursula Perano, she says, AOC on talks about her future ambitions with a heavy comment, quote, realistically, I can't even tell you if I'm going to be alive in September and that weighs very heavily on me. All dramatic. right, well, hold on, hold on. Girl did some mushrooms, huh? Oh, right. <laughs> oh my gosh. She's like, Face I'm getting ready for this. Life yeah. doesn't even exist. No, okay yes. to cry. <laughs> now, hold on. There's several questions. Does she have a terminal disease? Right. I hope mm. not. Okay. It's called, called not. life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is she suicidal? That's a serious question. Because saying something like that, I think people haven't thought about what she could mean Does by this. Suicidal. Right. And if she's not sick and she says something like, I don't know if I'll be alive, usually that's a sign of depression, especially in the context of this article. She says a woman of color can never be president because people hate them or something. It's like very <sighs> negative. She was crying when she said this. Really? She, they said that she had tears in her eyes. She does. Yeah, but, yeah. but you know what? We saw the fence. Maybe photos. she yeah. needs like a 5150 or something. She needs to be brought somewhere and given an evaluation because if you tell people crying that you don't know if you're going to be alive in September, we need to sit you down and ask you what's wrong because if you ignore this, something bad could happen. We want her to be okay. And I know the left is going to be like, oh, shut up. And they're like, no, dude. You, you, okay, we're going to play a game. Pick one. Do you think she's referring to a civil war and that racists would come and kill her by September? Yes. yes. You think that's what she's talking yeah, about? Yeah, I think her. she's shook up you from think, the January 6th thing and it hasn't left you her You think yet. that a couple of weeks ago, she was sitting there thinking, a couple of weeks from now, a bunch of white racists are going to start a civil war and I'm going to die. She probably thinks that she's a target if something like that were this to happen. Is, she'd be at, like, after January 6th, she was like, I, I could have died. You but know? she's not if walking around there, with security detail. See, this is, this is my point, right? The assumption a lot of people make is that she must be talking about like what Kathy Griffin is talking about or something like mm. that. The other question is, okay, all right, most people are probably going to think it's something to do with political conflict. We still have to ask questions about like, dude, I'm the Civil War guy. I'm like mm -hmm. ranting and raving about it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think in three weeks there's sure. going to be a bunch of racists going around hunting <laughs> right. down women of color. Maybe it's well, her, climate change. Her, like co yeah, no, right, climate exactly. Her, <laughs> comments, <laughs> her comments remind me more of like... Uh, Mark Ruffalo, didn't he have this thing? He's like, if we're around for yes. long enough for me he to did. Have She did say the world was going to end in 12 years a few years ago. I right? think that True, yeah. if she'd been living in with September, purpose, like, it wouldn't yeah. matter if she's alive or dead. Like when you're living your purpose, you don't lament about when it might end. You're just mm. doing it. So obviously, maybe she's lost a lack of purpose. She feels kind I mean, of aimless. This was a, a crazy interview on a lot of fronts. I also enjoyed during it that she said she wasn't sure it would be like, good for her to marry a white guy she's currently engaged to a white guy yeah. that she's been dating maybe she's like years. he's gonna kill me in my like, sleep she <laughs> seems like she's got a lot of anxiety she needs to work out and i'm i'm being a little sarcastic there but also like you are setting yourself up for a lot of scenarios where you feel like at any point your life could fall apart and or be in danger like something is wrong i think oh, she might be suicidal wrong. really maybe i think i think we we are looking through the lens of the culture war and so we are assuming that someone political like AOC must be referring to what we see mm -hmm. instead of asking a very simple question. When you hear hooves, it's not zebras. It's usually horses. Mm -hmm. The GQ article says tears pooled in the corners of her eyes. Mm. She says, I hold two contradictory things in my mind. One is the relentless belief that anything, anything is possible. At the same time, my experience here has given me a front row seat how deeply and unconsciously as well as consciously so many of these people in this country hate women and they hate women of color. Hmm. People ask me questions about the future and realistically, I can't even tell you if I'm going to be alive in September. What? Why is the immediate assumption, like if, if, you, if you started off from a blanket 
no reference to any individual mm -hmm. and said, someone says that in three weeks they might not be alive. Your immediate reaction wellness would not be, check. well, they're talking about civil war. No, no yeah, you'd say no. wellness yeah. check. Yeah. You'd be Absolutely. like, okay, why do you think that? The first question might be like, are, are, are they sick? Like someone who thinks they're gonna die in a few weeks, are they terminally ill, they have cancer? I mean, maybe AOC does and we don't know about it, I don't know. But I think, I, I, I either, she, look, either mm -hmm. she's insane and she mm -hmm. thinks that a bunch of crazy extremists are gonna come kill her, which, that sounds insane. I, yeah, or sound. she's depressed and crying in an interview about how people hate women of color and she doesn't know she'll be alive in September. Right, but yeah, her leading with the people hate women of color is the thing that's kind of bringing me into the fact that maybe she's talking about extremism or... But also, if you grew up always believing that you were the victim and your job is to overcome, you've got to do it and like, you're also the victim, but you're still kind of winning because you got to Congress, but also you're still the victim. Either like, way, this, wellness check. Exactly, yeah. that's her. What yeah, she what opens with, like, though? I hold two contradictory things in my mind. Like, this is a very... Confused I'll, I'll put a divided this. person. Yeah. If if she said this to like a psychotherapist who wasn't involved in the political world, mm -hmm. he'd probably be like, um, yeah, okay, you need about a need three month vacation, girl. Well, well, three days, an evaluation. Just go to sit down Hawaii some or something and, and look at the waves. Just yeah. sit if, on the beach. If she genuinely believes that there's going to be white racist men hunting women of color, that and that's why she'll die. She needs serious therapy. She needs a break right now. I don't know how long, yeah. but she needs to get out and she needs to go talk to a doctor because that's crazy. She's, it, I, think it's, I think it's a fair assessment to say she lives in a world where Biden comes out and says the MAGA extremists are a threat to this country, where she hears in the news all day about white supremacists and she genuinely internalizes and believes this is the world she lives in. Mm -hmm. That's possible too. But I also think that is still using our echo, echo chamber worldview we know about political problems, so to, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We assume that political people must view the world this way, and if she does, that's the real reason, when in reality, it's like, dude, she's extremely high profile, mm -hmm. she gets people shitting on her all the time, maybe she's just, like, maybe not in a good place. Maybe the pressure is a lot. It yeah, is. I, which I, I can have a lot of empathy for that. Uh, you know, I will point out again, I know it sounds random, but she did get engaged in April. And I think that you know, the idea that she's moving forward with this high profile relationship, she's already in Congress. Like, where do I go from this pinnacle career? I mean, people mm -hmm. regularly include her in polls to become president. Like, what if she is actually unhappy with where her life is? She can't walk away from this, right? It was a big, big change. Big jump. Mm -hmm. Be, yeah. Like people rag on her. I, I think it was great that she was a bartender. I think that the idea that a regular person can, you know, get a seat in Congress is, is fantastic. I think it's stupid to insult her over it. But imagine going from no public persona to being the one of the highest profile Democrats. Yo, it is stressful. One of the highest right. ranking officers on the Death Star. The United States, <laughs> the military machine is the Death Star. And all these people working in Congress are serving on the Death Star. So I understand her state of mind is broken because she's like, what am I doing? What Like, that's just existential. That's like mm -hmm. underneath the, the content on top of what sure. she's been feeling. And this girl's tuned in emotionally. She's like, we're talking about leftists are emotional, rightists are logical. But where, like she's what, very emotionally I, in like, tune with what she's feeling. Like with Mark Ruffalo. He was asked, will you be the the Hulk in the future? And he goes, if the world allows it and I'm still around, mm. the interviewer didn't follow up with, hold on there a minute. Do you Wait, think what? you're going to die? <laughs> the interviewer here as well. She, like, well, you're not going to be alive in September. Mm -hmm. A good interviewer is going to be like, are you sick? Yeah. Are you depressed? Or do you think the war is going to break out in a couple weeks? Especially if she's been on the verge of tears throughout this whole interview. Like, it's well, not, I don't know about yeah. the whole interview. It's or at that, least that point, right? right if you're hitting emotional crying. notes in an interview yeah. and then this sudden person suddenly like, and I'm going to, I might not even be alive in September. Like, you're not having a like, haha, we're joking around. I don't even know if I'll be alive. That like, you have to respond to the gravitas of what's going on. Right. This seems like I gotta, clarifying questions. Only hitting with serious notes. You know, she's I gotta, having I a, say a red pilling on. breaking moment right now. Maybe now, I went through that in you 2008 think? and nine. I was suicidal. I thought for sure, like I mm. gave up. I, I thought, oh, the world, like we've got the Federal Reserve is we, we've been under this system. Like there's no hope. I, I had completely given up. And, but I, I still wanted to have hope. I had that other part of my brain, like she's saying, where I'm like, I know everything's possible. Here, here's, here's what I want y'all to do right now. And just stop a second. Imagine someone sitting in front of you, or think of a random person you know, crying, says to you, I might not be alive in a few weeks. Well, why? Hey. Why? That was the first thing but, I would say is but, why? But exactly. The fact that she said this, it's like, again, we're, mm -hmm. we're approaching this from a political perspective. Yeah. Think about how you would feel if someone you knew told you that. Yeah, so I'd be like, "Yo, you, we need a doctor." Like, we yeah, got like, you're staying okay with me for the next three weeks. Yeah. I'm the doctor right now. I'm not a doctor, by the way, but tell me why. 
at least you know let's start with friendship and then if it if it's unresolvable yeah. maybe we'll get a psychotherapist yeah this is this is a crazy thing to say it and they publish it's a crazy it. thing to not follow up on especially like where's mm -hmm. the journalist in this one wesley lowry what are you doing okay so journalists aren't mandatory reporters like you have in the hospital in the hospital if somebody said something like this yes you are on suicide watch you don't right. get to have any cords you don't have any cutlery you have to eat finger foods R let's, let's clarify that if if in the hospital someone told you i might not be alive in a few weeks you would report them and we would put yeah. them on suicide watch which was supposedly what epstein was on he clearly wasn't because he still had access to sheets you don't have when, access to anything right when you get arrested they take your shoelaces and your belt away exactly and yeah. and, and because they don't want you to kill yourself or right. someone else i would imagine i've had Perhaps. yeah several family members baker acted and as soon as you say anything toward the lines of of harming yourself it's immediate you're being yeah. put in a facility and you're there until they feel like you're not a threat to yourself anymore but you know you know what's gonna well, happen and she's making this comment to a journalist like what is she saying to people she really trusts and knows like right. that's what's so disturbing true. to me i think what you're going to hear is many on the left are going to dismiss this downplay it say it's the far right because they would prefer she be be in a desperate and dangerous position if it wins their wins for them politically. That's right. They don't care about her. Uh, That's so, the sad part. If she did go and do something to herself, the amount of people who would like use it as a story and use it as a way to move forward their political agenda. Would another be. possibility is she is a sociopathic narcissist who faked tears and said this to try and win brownie points in the media not think like believing to herself there's no real threat and she's just sure. a crazy person well and she, if she is someone whose emotional spectrum is kind of off she can perform emotion she knows how to cry you know on cue let's say but she doesn't actually always feel the weight of her words mm -hmm. you know she can say like i'm not even not even be alive and not know what what the appropriate response yeah, yeah, yeah. to that to be like if she pictured someone's in front of her saying oh, i might not be alive in september would she respond with like we need to talk about that are you okay or would she respond with like well, I really need you to vote I know, early then. I know what's going on. What's going on? Tell us, Tim. AOC oh. is likely depressed because of Instagram and TikTok. I actually believe that. She's not getting enough likes. Yeah. We have this story from the Daily Mail, addicted to being sad. Yep. Teenage girls with invisible illnesses known as spoonies post TikToks of themselves crying or in hospital to generate thousands of likes as experts raise concerns over internet-induced wave of mass anxiety. This is real. It's this true real. that young women are getting depressed because of Instagram and TikTok. And as, as far as it goes with AOC, we were just talking about how she said she might not be alive in September, which to me is indication an indication of depression or severe, I don't know, what, what would you call it, like paranoia. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's possible that, you know, she's in the limelight in this position. If she starts putting out posts like any other individual susceptible to depression from these platforms and she's not getting the likes or the attention, she might get depressed. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this now with teenage girls across the board. Well, and she is one of the most followed, like, has the biggest social media presence of any member of Congress. I mean, she has really cultivated her brand as being someone who is in touch with her followers. She does upgrades, updates through her Instagram Live and through Twitter and things like that, like as well as shares her skincare routine and she sells fun merch. Like yep. she is as much an influencer as she is a politician and public figure in so many ways. She's more an influencer. Yep. Right, yeah. exactly. And so in some ways, you know, I could see if she's won re-election and she's had this moment where she was sort of this fun golden girl for the left. Uh, and if any of those numbers drop, like if she's getting 80,000 likes on a photo instead of the 110,000, she's going to feel that burn so intensely the same way that, you know, teenage girls are susceptible to it, too. Yeah. But like it is You'll, not just her identity. It's also her career. You see this throughout the history of YouTube. One day, a popular YouTuber will make a video saying like, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And then all you got to do is look at the views for their past videos and you see them going down and then yep. all of a sudden they snap. Yep. So people, it's, it's really amazing to me. I remember getting a message from someone. It happens all the time. And they'll be like, are your views down? And then I'll be like, yes. And they'll be like, dude, something's going on. I'm like, it's called summer. Yeah. <laughs> like, summer happened. People went outside. Calm down. Yeah. Like, you see, I see these trends all the time. And there are people who, you know. They should was, promote global warming so they stay inside. Well, I, I remember, yeah. uh, you know, like two years ago, it rained for a week straight on the East Coast across the board. Mm -hmm. And then one day I got message from people being like, dude, my views are cut in half. I'm panicking. Like, what's going on? I'm like, bro, the rain stopped. Everybody went outside for the first time in a week. Calm down, man. Mm -hmm. But this is what happens to these young girls on, on social media. They'll post a picture of themselves, get 100 likes and go, ooh, 100. The next day they get 80. <gasps> They get depressed, they panic. Why aren't they getting likes? They delete the photo and repost yeah. one. Can I do better? Can I do better? Not yeah. realizing, bro, it's like two in the morning, people are asleep, calm down. I knew <laughs> girls who would, when they traveled out of the country, they would time their Instagram posts to go up. They'd like set alarm for like 3 a.m. So it was the correct time to post in America to get the maximum likes. Like, 
I didn't even grow up with TikTok. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> right. And I think social media has really morphed, too, where not only are we seeking validation through the likes, but your depression and anxiety is affirmed through social media. Mm -hmm. Like, social media used to be a highlight reel for people's lives. You follow these influencers, but you know it's not real. Like, yeah. they're in Hawaii, but they're probably arguing with their boyfriends behind the scenes, whatever the case may be. Now, it's a trend to cry on social media. It's a trend to show your panic attacks, and that gets you millions of likes. Or having, like, anxiety coping. Like, here are my anxiety copes, or here's my OCD coping. Or who right. are these things that I think I'm doing that are actually very yeah, strange behaviors? Weird. Or yes. misspelling words. So, <laughs> That'll do it too. Yeah. yeah so um, <laughs> it's a, it, it's true that if you misspell a word in your title, you'll get mm -hmm. more engagement as people want to correct you. Wow. So what happened is a bunch of YouTubers started intentionally misspelling words, like simple typos. Mm -hmm. And then little kids who are watching it started misspelling the words that way, thinking it was spelled correctly. Mm. Yeah, your social media is is melting the brains of humanity. I gotta yes, tell you. and uh, particularly young girls. I did an episode one time because I was scrolling on, on TikTok. I do have the app, regrettably. Oof. But I was scrolling it's part of it. your job. You it is to. part of my job. <laughs> but I kept getting videos of young girls who have Tourette's-like tics. And I kept getting them. And it's multiple girls, multiple girls. And I was getting recommended these videos and upon watching them found that several of them had the exact same tick so i started looking into this and doctors talking about it and they actually had doctors saying these girls are being so heavily influenced by a mix of anxiety and tiktok they are they are developing functional neurological disorders that are real that are real they're not just puppeting Yo. and parroting they're actually developing these anxiety induced tics. i'm a huge fan of video games but man we are tweaking our brains with modern technology yes no, but think of it's like, like a big experiment dude the mm -hmm. emotional development that teenagers are going through like part of being a teenager is looking at your peers around you and figuring out what the social norms are so if you're only being fed people who are behaving in you know maybe they really do have Tourette's and they have you know an issue and they're trying to talk about it or bring awareness but if you're constantly being served like I have anxiety I have depression I have Tourette's like you are then trained to be like maybe I do too yep. and you start seeing it anywhere because that's part of the emotional growth that teenagers are going through like yeah yep. we should keep them away from this stuff it's it's not like we shouldn't talk about mental health or anything like that but like we don't need to shove it down their throats so constantly that they become paranoid they themselves Absolutely. have these issues. You know, issues. one of the things is that I've noticed is it's not so important how many followers you have, it's the quality of the followers. Are they really, mm -hmm. why are they following you? Is it because they're really listening to what you're saying or is it because they want to laugh when you fall down? Yep. I don't want those people following me. And the, uh, the problem with social media is just the number shows on your page so they think more is better. But then you get the subscri direct subscribers. This is where you start to realize the quality of the follower uh, or the watcher or the viewer or whatever is much better because you might have 10,000 people paying you 10 bucks a month that he might have 10 million people watching paying him nothing. Mm -hmm. He's way worse off. You're way better off with less followers, more quality. And um, hopefully young women, we can teach them that maybe through direct they don't realize well, and they see the internet as the be on end all there's i don't remember what study came out but most young people like one in four want to yep. be social media influencers yep. this is a whole new area of the world that they are completely devoted to right and they will never have a break from it if that's the career they choose to pursue yeah it's an augmentation to your career social media no one is just gonna land on being a social media influencer and that's it because if your life is boring no one's gonna watch your social media you've yep. got to do something cool with your life and then the social media will be there to show everyone or what you're you doing. you have to sell all of your personal information. You have to, as a young teen mom, start talking about your mm -hmm. past relationships. Or, you know, as you get married, you have to give all the details of everything that's going on. You have to sell who you are yep. in order to please people, which is a really morally corrupt way of living. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was younger and, the, you know, like MySpace first came out and stuff like that. We were on, I think it was like Live Journal was first. Yeah, I mean, Zanga. I, yeah, I, I was on CompuServe. You know, because my family had computers. Then Geo you got AOL. Cities. Yeah. Then uh, with AOL, yeah, you had GeoCities and other sites that you could you could make your own site. Then eventually you got like Live Journal. Then you got Friendster. You guys remember Friendster? Hell yeah. And then MySpace. <laughs> yeah. And I remember uh, Facebook came out, and it was like all the cool kids started migrating to Facebook. And I would see these posts from people that just looked so awesome and fun. And I was like, how come they're doing all this really so awesome neat. stuff, and I'm not? And then you know, it wasn't until later I realized like, oh, they weren't. Mm -hmm. They right. were faking cool things so they could look cool and like that was their, it was marketing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we end up we end up seeing this highlight reel of their life of all the coolest things they've done, but they staged a lot of it. 
They try to make it look as cool as possible. They try to make their lives look like movies so that you're jealous of them. Yep. My favorite is I know girls who have, um, when they go through a breakup, right? They start posting on their Instagram mm -hmm. or all their story all the time because they can't be the one that's at home and like sad. Yeah. They have to be busy and cool and having a great time. And their mind is somewhere else. Like these people don't realize no. they're robbing themselves of their own actual individual lives yeah. for the sake of other people who are viewing from their bedrooms. Yes. All they're it's giving insane. away is their own time, which ends up being their lives. And I you do want to say before we move on from the AO, all this AO, OC talk she's talking about holding two completely different views in mm -hmm. her mind at the same time i think she's about to get red pilled change my mind that's what it hope feels right. like hope i'm right i kind of went through something similar where i, I well i already t mentioned this I earlier just, yeah sorry keep going. oh I, I truly believed in the possibility of of, ev of, the, of the human race but at the same time seeing this insurmountable you know mountain of impossibility that i was up against and like mm -hmm. how the hell can i overcome a global monetary system well, but what if also a lot of the things that she's been preaching are not working and she's having to reconcile the fact that like there are policies that she is vocally back that she doesn't actually sh she's not sure Good she point. supports she isn't just a person she is a brand and identity that right. a lot of lefts want to cultivate in their own daughters like she can't we talk about this with jazz jennings sometimes like <sighs> there's nowhere to go from there like this person can only continue down this path and that's scary yeah. aoc can't come out and be like well that one bipartisan bill seems kind of right. good you know mm -hmm. she can't she has she can to never, continue down yeah. this path to get point. voted back in right and like if she she's gonna get married right but if she gets pregnant she's like well actually i'm gonna leave politics because i want to be a mom that's anti-feminist like oh you know i have some questions about the way lockdown went you know maybe that's not so good she's anti-covid you know she, there is no escape for her mm -hmm. and in some ways i have sympathy Cult for that yeah it's true I you can't say i was wrong the most you feminist can't. thing you can do yeah. alex is whatever you want mm -hmm. take control of your life baby such a I liberating like thing at, to have a favorite point, feminist most, at the table. Yeah. The yeah. Most have a baby, that's why I say Yeah, that. yeah, have a family and do whatever and you want. Like, you can always do politics later. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Well, I mean, no. if, if she's doing what she's do wanted anymore, to do leave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, but I think like right now, the whole trend is not to have a family. And mm -hmm. it's like, you have to actually resist the current to have a family, which mm -hmm. is the funniest thing. You yeah. know, it's like, it's been a meme forever to have it all. So the women who are like, you know, I decided I don't want to have a job and a career. I want to raise children. It's like, it's against the grain. But yeah. it is massively feminist to do that, to take control of your life if you want a baby. But that's why I think they intercede. I don't know how, I mean, how many people you know who are feeling the pressure to decide in your early 20s that you actually don't want kids and make a permanent decision right. to go past that. Like yep. They are trying to head this off the path because a lot of times you actually hear it from women who are in their late 20s or in their early 30s who are like, I thought the career was the most important thing, but I've reached this age and I actually would prefer to focus on my family. Mm -hmm. And if you can prevent people from ever having that door, when they hit 30, they have to continue to stand by that they made the right choice to have, get a hysterectomy when they were 21. Wicked cycle, wicked Yikes. cycle. And then if you decide at 30 that you want a family, but you don't have the man yet and you don't have the, you're you know. Sunk. You're sunk. You're Also, a bit. Yep. I tweeted this. Abortions increase the likelihood of miscarriage. That's true. So, Entirely we'll correct. I, I, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a very basic thing. I you know I, was, I saw the story from Jennifer Lawrence and she was like Roe v. Wade and things like that, and then I was like, look, if you support this stuff, like women need to be told this that if you get abortions, so like I, I, look, use condoms or whatever, try not to get pregnant. But if you get an abortion, you are increasing the likelihood that when you're older, you're not going to be able to have kids, mm -hmm. and that's because there's there's damage that's caused by it. It's mm -hmm. the same thing with uh, taking birth control for years. Like those have long term effects on the bodies, but because yeah. it's seen as this revolutionary tool that helped many women join the workforce and gain control of their body, like we're not supposed to criticize it. And I actually think that sets us behind. I've known a lot of women who have struggled with, you know, anxiety, depression, different things like that, and really had to push their doctors to be honest about the consequences of taking hormonal birth control and that's scary it's like insane. you can't even get accurate information because it goes against an ideology that we are supposed to be 100 percent behind yeah we've just jumped into a culture that says this is accepted here's the thing you need to do now do it and then 20 years later when we have the ramifications of it we're gonna be like and i, I wish women would hear that like you are they are willing to sacrifice you and your personal yep. choice and freedom and health to maintain this illusion that the ideolo ideology they pushed is worth having around yes. dude if you are willing to give up your power to medical tyrannists they will take it mm -hmm. but happily. it's empowering ian if you take the birth control pill it's empowering mm -hmm. i this is terrifying what you just said amala because i think that this is exactly what's happening with the kids now so you know mm -hmm. how like however many years ago it was birth control was an un you know unknown but they still encouraged people to take it it was so easy for me to get on birth control i had to i like half made up an excuse because mm -hmm. like i'm 19 now oh, it's time i gotta figure this out right you know, be smart or whatever and it was easy it was the easiest thing in the world and i'm terrified 
testified they're going to do the same thing with human hormones. Before we go to Super Chats, yeah. I want to give everybody an update on the, the song because it is now officially the end of the, the reporting period ended on Thursday. And uh, there's a bunch of really good news and um, a, a bunch of really fun news for those that are interested. So the first thing I want to say is Only Ever Wanted, the song we released uh, the 26th of August, is the number two most sold oh. song in the U.S. for the week of September 10th. That? We could not beat Elton John and Britney Spears, oh. but number two <laughs> with your help. So we were the second most sold song in the country. That's massive. It's huge. And the first song we officially release hit the charts, number 21 on rock and number 24 on hot rock and alternative. And uh, there's actually a bunch of others. This is really funny. So we're at number one alternative digital sales, number 24 hot rock and alternative, number 21 rock, number 28 in Canadian sales, <laughs> nice. number Thank one you, in rock sales, Thanks, number 21 uh, on rock and will of the people which we released two years ago, hit number 17 in alternative digital sales, which is huge. And uh, I'll tell you exactly why this mattered. And I was correct. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you were as well. I knew that invading the cultural spaces with apolitical content was going to trigger them to an extreme degree. And not only did they put, produce a, a bunch of videos, ragging on the song, completely getting disproven. They're saying, oh, the song is bad and it's stupid and we hate it. And uh, it's got like 70,000 likes, 1.7 million. It's got tons of streams. Number two digital song sales. You can't lie with the billboard charts. We objectively placed among some of the biggest songs in the country. There are a bunch of bands that I'm a huge fan of that release songs all the time that never chart. And I'm sure you know that exactly is the same thing. But here's the best part. Um, without getting into specifics, when our communications people started reaching out and saying, here's a song from Pete Parada, Tim Pool, and Carter Banks. They got so effing pissed. No joke. I, Who's like, they? Industry press. We're going to, for the time being, until I can do a deeper assessment, not going to reveal the names of these individuals and the things they said, but they mm. were legit effing pissed. Mm. I hate these people, F you, like kind of stuff. Wow. Refusing to write about it. I love it. It's like, does your bias against someone preclude you from doing your job? Apparently. Well, here's the best part. <laughs> they cannot ignore it. There are tons of mainstream established rock bands that don't chart when they release songs. And uh oh, we did. So how long are they going to be able to hold out ignoring the fact that we put out music that lands on all of their charts? It's going to get really funny when after the third time we chart, they're like, we're still not going to write about this. And then people start saying like, hey, wait a minute, band, that song on the radio, you're not writing about something's It'll, messed the up. The fifth hit that comes out will be they'll they'll all of a sudden they'll write about it and be like, but well, we always loved Tim Pool. We always loved Good, that rock right. band or whatever the hell it's called. Good. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. I hope that's the case. The retconning. Look, so uh, there are some issues with reporting on some of the numbers. Just take a look at what happened with Tom McDonald when he talked about how his numbers weren't tracked properly and they wouldn't put him on billboard and things like that. We've 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 bumped into a little bit of that, mm -hmm, but they can't deny it because sometimes the numbers are too much based on the metrics we got. And where we land on the charts, I am 100% confident that the next song we put out is going to chart substantially higher. And they're not going to be able to ignore the fact that we are pushing into the cultural spaces they once owned and don't own anymore. It might be the third hit when they start writing about it. I said fifth. It might be the third Maybe. one. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I just, that, this is the point. And so let me just say that behind the scenes, I'm talking with a bunch of other big companies and artists who have seen similar problems and are sick and tired of the woke cult controlling the establishment, controlling the arts. And so we're talking and uh, some fun and funny stuff is going to happen. And then I'm, uh, look, number two on Billboard for sales. And now what are they saying? Sales don't matter. No, sales are, they, they don't matter. Oh, okay. Yeah, tell that to Nicki Minaj. Tell that to uh, DJ Khaled. They're on the, look, we beat DJ Khaled, God dead. Now I get it. Not everybody buys these days, but it's still one of Billboard's top charts. Sales, it matters. And regardless of that, I'm not saying we came out with the Hot 100 number one hit. I didn't expect we would get anywhere, to be honest. A bunch of my favorite bands don't even make the charts, and we did. They're really pissed off about it. And we're going to keep pissing them off. So thank you all so much for helping us do that. And uh, we're going to keep putting up music. And we're going to build that library. And we're going to be signing other artists. And we're going to go for people like, look, the Daily Wire brought on Gina Carano when they canceled her. And boy, did the, did the corporate institutions, they got all pissed off. She was canceled. She wasn't supposed to be working and doing movies. Now she's in a bunch of movies. She's doing better than ever. They're trying to keep you in fear. 
so that when you work for them, you don't speak out and you don't speak up because then you'll lose your job. When we succeed at producing this and we plan on moving forward, signing more bands and producing more music, how long until another industry uh, executive or a, an engineer or producer says, you know what? I don't need to work for this garbage anymore because I can go work for any one of these other companies. That's what we need to build. And that comes from the success of the projects we're working on. Do I think it's the greatest song ever written? I don't know. It's just a song we wrote and produced, but apparently it did well enough. The next one we put out is going to be even better. So thank you again, uh, everybody, for, for your support. And um, we'll see what happens with, you know, my, my attitude is I want to publish all the emails from these people so you can see just how, how angry they are. But maybe it's not a good idea. You know, I, I got I to see they're not my emails. We use a we use a third party company. So not my emails to share. But what I'm hearing is there's like effectively saying F off and F you. And they're they're very, very angry about it. It's kind of like an inoculation. Someone gets a shot in the arm. They're like, ow, that hurt. But if, if you like show everyone what a, you know, what a what a pansy they were when they got the shot, they're mm. not going to like you in the future. But after the inoculation, they feel better. They're like, oh, OK, it was, you know, we're going to keep making music a little. Sooner or later, one of the songs we make will chart very, very high oh and God, maybe be maybe be a top 40 or something. And it's going to be really funny when they finally begrudgingly with anger in their eyes, right? <laughs> song by Tim Cass is good and people really like it. It's making me love again. Uh -huh. Maybe it won't be a song by me. It'll be a song by someone we sign. But the fact is, when we put out this music and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys how it works right now. I'll let you in on some industry secrets. So uh, and I think the CPM for songs is like five bucks. What is it like five dollars for every thousand or something like that? I could be wrong. But uh when you're a band and you put out 20 years of music and you've got 100 songs, you're not charting. It's the volume that people across the board listen to music that makes you money. So we're looking at this from a business perspective. We're going to be able to produce music and make money. That's the goal. Now that it's looking like we're going to be able to make money doing this, we can sign a bunch of bands and build up a label. And then uh, we're going to take over the cultural institutions. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll start reading some super chats. So s smash the like button. You're not even saying that in front of a podium with red light behind you. Yeah. It's not even as scary mm -hmm. as we think it should yeah. be, but still moving. We yeah, should have dimmed the lights while he was yeah, talking. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. YouTube's giving me the business, but we're going to pull up some uh, super chats if we can, because mm -hmm. the thing keeps crashing. So smash the like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends, all that good stuff. Here we go. Super chat time. All right. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, Tim, I blame you. I'm stressed. Before you, I was ignorant to the evil set out to destroy us. Now I daily rack my brain. How can I help? What more can I do? Though in the end, I effing love America. TY for new eyes. No, look, like people are, are screaming that CNN is moving to the right or whatever. They're calling for boycotts. <laughs> yeah, we're winning. They're thrashing about. It may get bad, but the reality is we're winning the culture war. As everything I described with the music stuff, yeah, they're really mad about that. I love it. Do you yeah. think it's fair to say that in some ways they are moving to the right because they were so far left and now, was it Chris Lish is his name? He was like, I don't want as much partisan. We have to get back to being center. Mm. Yeah. And so the cr criticism that they're moving to the right in some ways is true, although like not the way they're presenting it. Yeah, moving to the center. They're moving another to the way center. To right, yeah, to get yeah. right back to the center. Like it doesn't make any sense. I think we're winning. I don't know. I feel like we are too. Like how much more can this be sustained? The well, complacency what, alarm what goes off. Yeah. Yeah. Vic, Vic, don't say that don't too say early. Say Guys, back you out. still have to be active. Yeah. Victory <laughs> is when these corporations say, we can't do this anti-Trump stuff. It's hurting the business. And CNN starts laying people off who are ideologically driven and not fact driven. Then yes, we are winning. It's absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. And then that, if CNN goes moderate and actually starts reporting the news, hey, I'll give them, I'll give them credit. We got to cheer on when they do good stuff. Now, to be honest, I don't think they will. My, but mm. is that just can. a... I think the, they'll have to. They won't make money. That's the best part. The right-wing grift at the left complained about all the time. Yeah. We mentioned the other day, business people are going, Ex explain this. Wait you make money second. doing this? Mm -hmm. This gives you money. Oh, yeah, let's invest in that. <laughs> I was thinking it's like the victory of a, ba a cultural battle, it, which isn't really victory. It's winning a battle. But what is the overall war score goal here? Like, what's the what's Individuality, the cultural freedom, war? personal responsibility. People saying it is up to me to work hard to live a better life and make a better future for my kids. It's people saying I'm not going to demand the government pay my bills. I'm going to do my best. It's not about what my government can do for me, but what I can do for my government. We got to look out for corporations. What, what was it saying? Taking, what Jim K said? 
country. That's not, not about government. what your country. 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 Right, right, because yeah. government's a bad word. I was going to be like, yeah, government. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I want to do anything for my government, but country. I'll do something for my country or for my fellow man. Agreed. Right. We got to look out for international corporations that take that message of individual responsibility and highlight it on a show for the entire world to watch like slaves, mm. to like laud. So that, that if you've seen a black, there's a Black Mirror episode where they do stuff like that. Um, they will try and co-op the message of individual liberty as well and put it on a pedestal. Of course. Yeah, they'll co-op any message that services them and that people are willing to pay for. Yep. It's really that simple. Correct. Uncle Yoda says, Ian, I need you to wear a wizard suit for Halloween. Anyways, y'all are doing a great job. <laughs> great I'm so idea. so into that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Murph tries. DIY says, does anyone recall when Dr. Chris Martinson said they'd be using lockdowns for climate change? Mm-hmm. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. I don't Pepperidge insert Farm yeah. <laughs> insert name here says NorCal here Tim don't forget that Chairman Newsom also banned the sale of fuel powered generators and that motorcycles are included in the van amazing man wow. I saw a video of somebody trying to uh, power up their electric car with an oil generator and it's just like <laughs> we're uh, that was real. I, I, I probably real. should I'm, I I don't want to uh, uh, give away too much but we're working on a, a vlog episode script based on green technology failures. So like the electric car have to be Smart. plugged into a generator, stuff like that. We have some funny gags planned for it. But that's there's a there's a vid, uh, an image going viral right now of a a, gener- uh, a Tesla plugged into a gas generator or a diesel yeah, generator. Yeah. Amazing, unbelievable. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> Salty Duckling says y'all should do a doc mini series with the Daily Wire called How We Got Here. Cover the left and right's perspective of the event leading up to today's political climate so we have a resource to show those we are trying to save. 9-11. Like that, yeah. It was 9-11. That's the <laughs> it was Gamergate. Incident. All Gamergate. Yeah, it was all Gamergate. Yeah. Just Gamergate. Yep. <laughs> oh, man. Gamergate was, what, 10 years ago? Jeez, don't say that. Yeah. Wow. I, I wasn't paying attention when that reached. happened. Nine were years you? ago? No. You were like 12? I was not paying attention. I was still like in my... Little bubble, my yeah, little kid bubble. Yeah. Playing, I guess who I was it? literally 12. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. I was not concerned about <laughs> not, not a joke for real. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Were you following it, Gamergate, when it happened? A little bit. Yeah, I, I saw, you know, like uh, Sargon, Carl Benjamin, yeah, and like Shoe on Head. How I met, how I found out about him. Yeah, but I, I didn't know too much about it. I did know that these companies were enacting this policy stuff because I was working for them, mm. you know. They were getting woke, going broke. Yeah. Mm. Ryan Miller says, "Miss the live show celebrating my first birthday as a father, fa- as a father, Aww. but a late birthday gift to myself with a shout out to little Jackson Gilligan. Oh, Jackson, yes. Jackson Gilligan, yay, fatherhood. We love it. Yeah, I'm here good, for good, it. Good, good, San OT says, San OT says, bad thing is now on the Chrome extension store. Bad thing. So bad thing. It yeah. was the extension idea we had where basically mm-hmm. you take negative words now. for the right, like fascist, and it just says bad thing. <laughs> awesome. I gotta look so, that up now. <laughs> That's a great idea. Just, I hope so. you, <laughs> disrupting you, all the cultural institutions. You install okay. the extension, it replaces Trump. all the words with bad thing. Wow, <laughs> CNN would just be like bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, bad thing. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Donald Trump likes bad thing and wants bad thing to happen. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Straight bad up. thing. Straight up. We want good thing. <laughs> yeah. That's Seamus's joke, by the way. Yeah, Shout I hope Seamus, Seamus made it. Has he not done it yet? I don't know. Unsolicited says Crowder is sharing all of his parodies on Spotify for free this week. Maybe we can make another cultural impact by downloading seasons of Trump. I saw that. I just want to. I just want to tell that. everybody. It's a lot. It's it's for the the big commentators. It's not co- very difficult to get on these charts as long as you do it properly. You you got to make a good song, obviously, but uh, it's not as hard as people realize. You, you know, one of the things I think we're seeing is these uh, these book publishers are going to commentators and 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 mm-hmm. you know political figures. And saying, can we do a book with you because your brand will market and sell this book right. in a big way. It's a brand. That's what you got to do. We got to do with music. We'll just go around to every person and, and get them a song. There you go. It's true. And it doesn't have to be like overtly political like Tom McDonald and like the Bryson Grays. Like your song wasn't. Yeah. And that's, I think, a beautiful thing about it because it gives us a, a better view of just not being political all the time and everything. But that's us. why they're so pissed off. <laughs> right. So like the political stuff doesn't bother them because they know where to put it. And it's easy to be like, hey, look how far right that is. Yep. But when the song, so like Only Ever Wanted is just a love and pain song. Mm-hmm. So when regular people start hearing that, we're getting Shazams, meaning people are hearing it and then wondering what it is and playing it. Yep. Those regular people are, being, are falling into our sphere of influence and it's pulling it away from the cultural institutions. You're like he has a podcast? Exactly. Click. Tell me. And that's what they said. You see the Daily Beast article? No, I didn't. They said that I'm trying to lure people into my right wing, oh, right the, wing world. The alt right pipeline with your oh, yes. van with candy and that. alternative yeah. emo yeah. pop. Yeah. I love it. I told, it. I told Seamus he's got to do a cartoon where I have like a pipe and I'm like bopping about and tooting and like people are following me and like 
marching into the GOP <laughs> convention. Oh my gosh. <laughs> People oh. are just like, Ey. yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Sailing down I mean, the river on a raft. That'd be awesome. While you're playing the flute. So I want to say for the Cast Castle vlog, um, it's if we, I think we put the full thing on YouTube, we'd probably get banned for it. Because Ian's running for union president, and then something happens at 3 a.m. It's really That's good. That's crazy. And, uh, mm -hmm. It's not based happens. on real events. It's That's just not, right. It's no. fictional. Purely fictional. Just fictional. fictional. Yeah. Chris just fictional. is amazing. He is like his. It was like his debut. I mean, I well, know well, he's been doing work is, for a while, but he's really good. Ian, Ian was running for union president against Chris, and you know everybody voted. But there are employees who don't work here, mm. so we the, we had to wait for the absentee ballots. Right. Distance which naturally. Came in at 3 They're emailing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's disturbing. Yeah. yeah. The and windows then, covered up. And then, <laughs> yeah, I bet everybody can figure out crazy, what happens right? next in the show. So crazy. We're but it was, uh, but it was a free and fair election. That's free. right. The free Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Can't question it. And then we have a cameo from James Lindsay, who sword fights Roberto Jr. That's on YouTube. Love it. Yeah. Right on the yeah. Cast Castle YouTube channel right now. If you want to see James. Yeah. It's funny because he was like actually showing us how to do sword sword fighting because James literally knows how to sword fight. Really? He does, yeah. yeah. He's very talented. You got to be prepared, you know? You, you never just, know. You don't want to leave behind as a skill. Hey, Amen. When the Civil War comes. That's right, yeah. We don't know what weapons we'll have is the thing. <laughs> this is true. That's true. Philip yeah. Reed says, Tim talking about making a tween pop song reminded me of Spose and his song Pop Song, which was about the big labels telling him he can't make what he wants and that he needs to make this instead. <laughs> you know that song Love Song by Sarah Bareilles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know the story of that? Yeah. I'm going to write you a love song. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I guess the story is that the label said, write a love song, it sells. And she was like, I don't want to. And they were like, well, that's what sells. So then she wrote, I'm not going to write you a love song because you asked for it or it whatever. blew up. Good for yeah. her. Yep. Stick to your guns. That's right. Yep. All right. Denny Decibel says, Amala, have you come across David Barton and the Wall Builders Museum? If so, what do you think? If not, will you look um, them up? I will look them up. Never heard of them. Hmm. David yeah, Barton. No idea. That name's kind of familiar. No. Pizza makes my belly hurt, says, my no. aunt works for the DNC, came home from DC for a week. We started talking and said, you need to work on your white privilege. I looked her dead in the eye, trying to hold in laughter. We're from Syria. <laughs> oh, Amazing. Nice. What a conflict. Yeah. Paul Jones says, in reference to your comment about the left hating mixed race people, I can 100% confirm. I'm biracial as well, and I'm always called an Uncle Tom because I don't say America is the worst. Mm. Yep. Jeez. But that's like, uh, this is one of the things that really bothers me. They're always like, oh, you won't say America's the worst? Then you're an extreme opposite. Like, it's to make you feel ashamed and move closer to their point right. by pushing you in the direction of the extreme. Anything that falls outside of it, mm -hmm. it's all or nothing. Always. Like, it's not even who you're, so you're a Republican. It's like, oh, so you're an extremist? Right. Waffle Sensei says, the left only shows the straw man crazy people on the right. And the right only shows the straw man crazy people on the left. It's orienting people to believe that everyone else is polarized and there is no middle. How do we beat that? Thoughts? False. Mm. Um, I do think it's true um, to a great degree, but the left is it's the rule and the right. It's the exception. Many people on the right only show the crazy on the left. All of the prominent lefties only show or lie about the people on the right. So, you know, for example, we've given praise to several people like Hal Kalinske and, you know, Crystal Ball, for instance, were fans and Jimmy Dore as well. Highlighting Jimmy Dore, I think, is, I think is a great example of showing someone who's on the left who has socialist policies, but calls out what sh what what is false and wrong. Jimmy's an mm -hmm. awesome dude that and, and you know, well, but I guess we're middle of the road, I, I suppose. But uh, Tucker Carlson has Antifa on his show. He used to have a lot more, a lot more lefties. Stephen Crowder routinely tries to debate these individuals, not the craziest, the prominent figures. These they seats, won't yeah. do it. They won't. Yeah. Yeah, we recently reached out to Anna Kasparian of the Young Turks. Ah. She was talking about crime and this massive spike that's happening. We're like, I gave her praise for it. I, same here. And we were like, we could have some common ground. I know we don't normally agree. Would you want to come on and talk about an issue that we can find common ground on? She goes on the Young Turks. I hate Prager You. They're disgusting. They're garbage. I wouldn't go on their show no matter how much they pay me. It's ridiculous. Yep. That's insane. crazy. Yeah. Dennis so, is a really balanced guy. He's kind of like he's a, a good dude. kind of a he is uh, all around. I don't know, a, a holistic dude. But they yeah. love to villainize him. Mm -hmm. They love to villainize him because he just fits the bill. You know, <clears throat> old white man. That's all it is. Red Dragon Emperor says, "Didn't get to say this last time, but Cali would not benefit from nuclear power due to a drought. Nuclear plants require one billion gallons of water per day. Mm -hmm. um, is that it, it's fresh water?" If it is, the north of California has fresh water. It's the south that doesn't. So they could do it, I guess. I didn't they, know about they, that. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, it makes sense. A lot. That seems like yeah. a lot of water. Crazy. Yeah, I don't know about a billion. A billion seems like a lot. Um, but I'm, I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to tell you wrong. I will say that's it's the cooling system. I mean, water comes in, mm -hmm. use water pressure. You oh. probably couldn't do salt because you'd get salt deposits. Deposits, yeah. 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 yeah so. And you'd need a constant stream. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, unless they can do like a self-contained system that the steam goes in, like an air conditioner or something like that. Mm, yeah. And then the salt melts and they use the salt, the liquid salt as a heat storage device. Mm -hmm. All right, Ted Scannon says, love seeing Amala here. Oh. And and that uh -huh. girl can sing. Oh yeah? This may be off topic, sing? but sh uh, but you should bring her in on a song. Cheers, everyone. That's awesome. <laughs> you do sing? I sing and play guitar, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, well, like, I have a record yeah, label. I would love to. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but we now produce music. <laughs> yes. music now. I, mean, I would love to. I do write music, so yeah, that'd be that'd be let's fun. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's. Uh, what, what do you want to do? You want to do like dance pop, like you know, Britney Spears maybe, Ooh, Elton know. John maybe. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. just kidding. They had, they had <laughs> number one. They were the number one. I think like most of the top music is usually like dance and hip hop because it's club music that's easily played. We could do that. I just want to make it. What do you do normally? What's your favorite thing? I mean, pop, I like country music. I love just like any good strong ballad, oldies, jazz. I love everything, everything. You want to write a song about your dog and your pickup truck? Hell yeah, brother. And being from Florida. Hell yeah, brother. Florida lady, yeah. All right, Mark Giudetti says, Tim will be too afraid to read this. Oh. And I know he wrote that because he knew I would read it. Right, right, right. Like, what how I get you? Yeah. Into reading it. <laughs> Ian speaks nothing but nonsense. He should learn to talk a lot less. You see, he tricked I me because he wanted me to say that. But Ian had a bunch Ian, of 20s tonight, so. Yeah, Careful with the all or none rhetoric. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah. Doesn't usually work. I, I, I gotta say, though, the, one in, the, the rolling ones and 20s was spot on. Yeah. Like, that uh, it's really too extremist does. for me. I need more sevens in my life. But you do, more but, but that was Holding your this crazy joke. hundred sided yeah. dice. Yeah. You're like, I had to roll a one or a twenty, and everyone's like, that's actually a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes Ian nails it. Like, wow, I gotta wait for my moment, and then he either come in hot and slice through it like butter, or I Ooh. crunch on the surface. Into it. Yeah. Yikes. Frieza says thirty eight thousand people watching in this video isn't trending. Not listed on any lives, and not the top search for Tim Pool. Damn. Hey. Makes me feel like a real hipster, you know? Yeah. Like, we have this cool thing so going cool. on, but no one knows about it. It's a subculture. Well, tell your friends. I finally Easy. get to be countercultural. We are a cult following. Yeah. The 11th, I think, the last I checked was the uh, Tim Kestyrell is the 11th biggest entertainment live podcast on YouTube. No big deal. And the 16th most super chatted. Or maybe the other way around. I think it's the 11th huge. most. I'm not sure. It's one. It's, I don't I don't know. it's top performing. It's great. huge. Yeah. So in terms of live performance, like we are the biggest like what the, like the 11th biggest or whatever or 16th biggest and then it's like but we're competing against like you know anime waifus and things like that so right. in terms of a real sit down human conversation podcast i think we are the biggest live yeah i'm not yeah. sure yeah probably uh but live when sense. it comes to like so here's another another issue episode per episode we're not the biggest but it's because we do five episodes per week many other podcasts do one per week and they'll get a million hits in that mm. one week, whereas we get, you know, like 10 million or something per week, but it's split up against all the other episodes. Right. So. Yep. Uh, so if we did one per week, all those views would concentrate and we jump in the. I wonder if politics is the wrong path. I mean, I know you you study it during the this day. It's an entertainment show. Yeah, it is entertainment. I try and make it entertainment personally. Um, but we have things like EU riots in the title of this video. So that's probably why it's not being shown and trending and stuff and if we were just talking about like ally mcbeal's butt and crap like pop culture that. crisis exists for that reason yeah, yeah. i don't want i don't like trash either week, uh, <laughs> yeah. pop culture crisis it's is not, not trash, trash. Not no like i don't hell. like talking about ally mcbeal's butt <laughs> like mean, brett's a genius Every, anything he does is good so i think part of it is like if we only chase like how can we stay trending and how can we do this we're also feeding the exact same you know comply with what youtube wants yeah. like mm. i'm really grateful that we're able to talk about things that we're all interested in but also not have to be like well we can't talk about that because like then we won't trend or whatever like i'm, I'm grateful that this has grown past that point because i'm sure in the beginning yeah. it was extremely helpful to trend i mean it was, it's a big deal this this show started off as more entertainment mm -hmm. it got more political because politics became Lockdowns, pop culture right yeah. but uh this show is still and always has been listed as an entertainment not not news and politics. Mm -hmm. And that's because we bounce around on cultural issues. In, it's, it's cultural politics. Mm. So it's tough, you know, I don't know. And it's tough to ignore crazy shit in the world. Like it's happening. And, and if someone doesn't talk about it, that's a big problem. But oh, yeah. I, I think, you know, there's, there's a, there, there was a question we had about whether it's news or entertainment and that news would be less jokey, less trolly, less silly. 
and very straightforward and very stodgy, like NPR podcast mm -hmm. would be a news podcast. So, you know, I, I, th this is more conversational, more entertainment than personality driven. And, yeah, 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 rather yeah, than yeah. news driven. Yeah, because I because I think if we if we went if we labeled ourselves as news, we'd probably be the top news podcast. But it's like, well, you know, like we don't like labels. Well, it's it's we just that you listen to like the New York Times Daily News Brief, and I'm like, that's a news podcast. Yeah, yeah. you know, the like today in the news, this is what happened. It's like, oh, well, John, I talked to somebody, and they said this. It's like we're we you know, we say silly things. And I feel like I contrast a lot with like the work that we do on the newsroom side of things, where we try to be really accurate and devoid of like opinion. We try to present things, whereas this show is more fluid and mm -hmm. has it has a different purpose, and people come to it for a, a different experience. Right. It's like Daily Wire has their journalism, but they have their personalities. Mm -hmm. You know. All right. Let's read some more. Buck Nuckel says. Tim, there's a Democrat county official here in Vegas who is who is being accused of stabbing a journalist in front of his home. Yeah. The journalist had ousted him, by the way. Rip wow. Jeff German. I saw that story. Mm -hmm. Dude, Crazy wild. dude, right? I did not see that. Crazy. You know? Good times over there. Augusto Mimoche says, a well-trained horse won't move if you just set the lead of their bridle on the ground because they've been trained that it hurts to pull on. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, they're like elephants. Yep. It's really funny. Uh, like... I don't want to say too much, but uh, some of the reactions from these journalists, they're just really, really angry that uh, Pete Parada is succeeding. He's so good. Mm -hmm. Well, outsiders and people who push back on the authority, you know, I got, I'll put it this way. If you're somebody who is really, really angry that you were forced to get the vaccine for your job, and then you find out other people are succeeding and they didn't, you're mm -hmm. probably really angry. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. You're like, but well, I had to do it. Why don't they have to? There's that video of the guys in the store. And he's like, is anybody else mad that we have to wear masks and she won't? Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Yep. Nailed I feel it. for Feeling. like a generation of people that are about to figure out what it means to take an experimental medicine. And there's going to be another level of compassion that we need to exist. Well, there's a, there's a lot of things. Uh, let me just go back in time to thalidomide. It was, that, 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 right? Yep. Thalidomide. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Do you know that, Ian? Yeah, yeah. yeah Their yeah. birth defects in kids. Yeah. It was like so, a, yeah. uh, an anti-nausea medicine. I only I bring that up to say one simple thing. The best we German. can do is find doctors that we trust. Yes. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation to people is if you're having issues and you don't trust your doctor, you better just find a good one. And like yep. experimental medicine, this is what I get, don't like about COVID is that it two weeks to slow the spread. That was the experimental moment. Is it going to kill humanity? Are we going to be bleeding out of our eyes like the stand? And we weren't. Like the stand. Then, yeah. <laughs> and then they, but for whatever reason, they went forward and pushed experimental medicine anyway. And I'm like, we had, we did well, the shutdown to find out. Yeah. Ian, we have to flatten the curve. You don't understand. Slow the spread, Whatever's flatten necessary. the J. I you really know? stand yeah. by my comparison to Pavlov's dog. Like they this. wanted to push as many buzzwords that will elicit an immediate response from people. No matter what the issue is, they'll just go back to these catchphrases so that you will comply. And at this time, they put out these news articles in the New York Times like the earth is healing. And a lot mm -hmm. of people predicted they'll do the same thing for climate change. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it looks like that's where we're going. Yep. Let's I want to read write this. a different article that's like, the, the family is healing because they're allowed to spend time together again. There you go. Interesting. Matthew Stockhausen says, just wanted to say today is my daughter Camilla's first birthday. Mm -hmm. In the past year, she has been the perfect angel. Only oh. issue was an RSV scare when she was three months old and was hospitalized for three days. Oh. Smiling the whole time. To be fair, not her fault. Well, all right. Ooh, happy happy birthday. birthday. Someone, uh, Johnny Hickson gave us a big red thumbs up. Well, all right. I love when dads yeah, brag about their kids. I think it's so cute. Oh, it's, yeah. adorable, it's adorable, yeah. Pablo Papano says, sounds like AOC regrets not being married and having kids. It does, doesn't well, it? She's getting on that train, isn't she? She No, she can't because she's a feminist. Mm. That's right, she can't. She can do anything. No, I'm not kidding. Kidding. She, the narrative. she can. I don't want to be too mean to feminists, but like, you know what? Uh, I do I, think that there is this, like, am I making the right decisions? And I think it has to do with policy, but I do think the, the article is interesting. She says, like, that it was her partner who was like, I want to get married by the end of 2022. And she was like, I don't know how I feel about that. But I don't know that she could have told this article as like the head of feminism, you know, yeah, I really want to get married. I hope you proposed. I wanted to propose three years ago. This right. is exactly what I talk about when I say I think she's about to get red pilled because she's about that age. She's about my age. And she's probably like, oh, yeah, I should really have a family right about now. But there was a story I saw earlier. A study sucks. came out saying that having kids makes you more conservative mm -hmm. on, on all these different issues. And I'm like, yes, surprise, surprise. People are no longer in favor of abortions for the most, like many people lose their favorite favorability towards abortion when they have kids. Yep. Mm. yep. And then there's a lot of women who are like contemplating it, had their kids and said, wow, I'm really glad I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's the weirdest thing that it's like, there's like these, these laws that say if a woman wants to get an abortion, someone has to counsel them on this stuff mm -hmm. because so many women have their kid and then are grateful that they did. Yep. That it's really creepy that you have to try and stop someone from explaining that to them 
Like, why? If they don't want to have an abortion because someone made an argument, let them not have the well, abortion. Yeah, what and did like, Elizabeth Warren say? She said, like, the, these uh, crisis pregnancy centers are torturing women, is yeah. what she referred to it as. I think that's crazy. insanity. But I, 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 look, 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 you take everything that's happening right now from the Democrats and the left, and the end result is less people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. whether you want to believe there's a conspiratorial depopulation agenda, doesn't matter. Intent is irrelevant. Their actions are leading to it. Yep. They sterilize their kids. They abort their kids. They advocate for not having kids at all. And now they're cutting the electricity and they yep. want to get rid of fossil fuels. Like all of that will result in less food, and less we, people, less yep. babies. Well, when you hear these conversations with people being like, oh, I'm choosing not to have children or I'm going to, you know, get Baby sterilized. Baby formula or, shortage. Mm -hmm. One of the things they say is like, I don't think I could do it. How could I afford it? How mm -hmm. could I find for Like, yeah, I would be stressed too if I didn't think I had, I was resourceful enough to figure it out, you right. know? Like they're told to put their needs over everyone else's. And then also it seems like it's impossible to even take care of yourself, or at least that's what they're told. Yeah. yeah and it's, I could understand the campaign that's going on. Yeah. yeah, 100%. All right, let's see where we are with some, uh... Paul Thongham says you should watch season two of Legion as a spinoff of X-Men. Just for the cold opens, they talk about psychology and uh, what does that say, psychology? And a lot of the cold opens talk about how you can, uh, about talk about you can see happened in real life. Mm. Oh, cool. Interesting. Like psychedelics and stuff. So Kanan says, AOC cred at the border fence looking at an empty parking lot. She's an actress for her audience. So that's the yeah. thing you kind of have to take into account. She did that at the border fence. She did the whole, I thought I was going to die on January 6th when she wasn't the in the building in tax question. The rich, tax the rich dress. She did the yeah. tax the rich dress. Uh, she cried about the state of where her grandmother was living in Puerto Rico without True. helping her. There's like so many things that have sort of lumped up as far as her being pretty dramatic. That's true. Waffle Sensei says, do not accept them not including your YouTube views. Every other artist in the world promotes their own material. Not everybody likes every song, but the people bought your music. The issue is, so we, we haven't got an official response yet, but um, before we, 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 we made sure that we were doing everything properly so that they could not try and exclude us. And we got um, some responses from the official tracking companies saying like, here's what you got to do and you're good to go. And we we're like, all right. And now they're like, well, it wasn't uploaded properly in a way that we can actually track really? the data. So, hmm. and then I'm like, okay, we'll self-report, right? Convenient. How else was it reported before the internet? Yeah. Like, can't I just give you the document? Like, here's our analytics. Here's the data from the back end, And that should be enough. They might say yes. So that's why I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, look, we did this totally independently with no idea what we were doing. It's entirely possible that we just screwed up. Fine. Whatever. That's fine. You know, the next song we put out is going to be even bigger then. It is what it is. I'm not I'm not going to start this by going to war before we have a chance to like, you know, basically push this through. The fact that we've made the charts already is like, fine, exclude YouTube. We'll figure it out. But we're already there. Every song we put out will end up charting, period. And that's going to be, I mean, that's it's kind of a crazy thought, to be honest. Yeah, really? What does that say for the state of the music industry right now? I Either assume, we're really I, great or something's really wrong. I, I mean, look, for a lot of the or big, both. a lot of the big established mainstream music artists, they always chart, always. But mm -hmm. most music you'll listen to, most of it never charts. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the crazy thing to me that like a lot of the songs that I'm really into, uh, and the bands that I like, like, you know, uh, well, I'm not going to name any bands because I don't want to talk about their their analytics and stuff like that. But they, they very few songs actually make it to the charts. Mm -hmm. They just put out a ton of music. People find it by the albums. And then over a long period of time, they make money off of it. Right, because charting is about like a small, finite period of time and how many views you get in that moment or buys you get in that yeah. moment, right? So it's like sales and also streams is like different charting methods. So okay. the Hot 100 is like just the best. I think if they included our YouTube views, we would have hit the Hot 100. Mm -hmm. Based on the other, uh, other bands that were there and the comparable metrics, I think so. Like we sold better than a lot of bands that are high up. Right. But obviously we wouldn't do better than the club music that's getting like 100 million plays or something like yeah. that. But that's it's whatever. Lo the, the, the top albums sell like hundreds of thousands. But I think the top alternative album sold like 50K, which is kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. what, the way it works is you get six months of pre-orders. Then all those pre-orders drop your, your opening week and they're counted as your first week sales, which is total BS. That's nonsense. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like you release the album. How many albums did you sell? Well, for whatever reason, they say you can six months in advance sell albums, and that counts as the first week release. So when you see a band mm -hmm. say, like, we sold 50,000 albums, and it's like, yeah, over six months. Right. Congratulations. I mean, it used to be, they sell way more back in the day. Now they don't. I'm fairly confident. Actually, I will say this. I know for a fact that if we did a pre-order on our album with a six-month lead time, we'd probably hit, like, the Billboard 200 at the top. 
we'd probably sell a couple hundred thousand. Well, based on, based listening, on the amount of sales we already had. That's without listening? They're just buying it because they have faith that it's going to be awesome? Or is it like, do they get a, a sample of the song or something before that? I no, I don't do. know. People just, so you know what? I'll just, I'll just tell you guys, we sold 12,500 songs in one week. That's number two. That is this. So if you can sell 12,520 some odd songs in one week, you'll be number two in digital sales. Did you get, who got number one? It was Brittany? Elton John and Brittany. How many did they sell? Did you get that number? Based on the metrics, I think they probably sold 25 to 30. Okay. Hmm. They're some of the most famous musicians in the world. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, it's, it's a lot. first song post um, conservatorship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's if, a big if, thing if, too. Yeah. If you're a, a new artist, like selling 12,500 songs Shoot. is not big. an easy task to do, you know? And, and so I really do appreciate everybody who supported us, but we have like, we have fans of the show, we have fans of the content we produce who supported us. And so it's a mix of general support, political support, and people who genuinely like, like the music that we've produced. But uh, I will just say that if that's the case of what we can pull off in one week, let's say we, we sold an album six months in advance. Mm -hmm. We have 24 weeks yeah, we'd have a top charting album. I don't want to do that though. I don't want to sell songs without them being out. That's like why I, I thought the pre-order stuff is so dumb. Yeah. Like we're going to put out a song and I think three weeks from now, we're, that's, the, that's the plan. We're waiting to hear back from our industry guys so we can make sure they can't exclude anything at this point. I guess people like the song they can order, sign up for the next one, get on the pre-order list yeah. for the next right. one. That's right. All right. We'll just, uh, we'll grab uh, one more here. Fleeting uh, Floating Feather says, Tim, sing Punch a Nazi. What a really great song. That's Punch a, great a Nazi. Song. It was a parody of uh, Paparazzi by Lady Gaga, mm. by Chris Ragon, and he took the video down. Oh, wow. Inciting, yeah. Yeah. inciting violence. He took it down it? because um, I think the, the reason is that he's scared of the left and bowed out and tried to get away from the culture war or something like that. That's what it felt huh. like. I didn't like yeah. that Punch a Nazi movement. That but that's, and then he was making fun of it. He was mocking the idea that to the left, everyone's a Nazi. And then I guess some leftist told him that he was helping Nazis. So he said, okay, and he took the video down. Crazy. It was a great song. It was a killer If you don't song, punch yeah. them, I don't think I ever listen to it. That's My friends, yeah. if you haven't already, you can check out our music on Spotify, search for Timcast. And there's uh, uh, two formal official songs, Will of the People and Only Ever Wanted, with several more to come. We've got uh, Bright Eyes. We've got, um, what do we got? I think we're calling it lockstep because genocide is not a good marketing term. No. <laughs> We've got Eyes of Advice. We've got A Million to One. Um, a lot of these songs you can already see like because we played, we jammed them before. Uh, words in a book. All of these things are, are getting ready for release. So thank you all so much for the support. Smash the like button. Subscribe to this channel. Head over to TimCast.com. Become a member. We're going to have a members only show coming up. You can follow me at TimCast IRL. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL. You can follow me at TimCast. Amala, do you want to shout anything out? Oh, yeah. You can uh, check out my stuff by typing in Amala Fenobi on any platform. I know that's a mouthful, but you can try. Uh, also, I'll be at PragerU.com if you worried about censorship. That's where I'll be. Cool. I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. You should go there every day and click on the read tab. You can follow me on Instagram at HannahClaire.B. And I'm Ian Crossland. Get me at IanCrossland.net. Again, check out Cast Castle on TimCast.com. Sign up. It's over on the left. You click it. Episode three. Happy to do it. Happy to see it. Bye. That's right. Cast Castle is not the only other show we have. We also have Pop Culture Crisis, which I was supposed to be on today, but I went and got my cast changed. We're all oh. signing it. Look, it's really awesome. I have, oh, you can't even see it. Oh, I want to show everything. Um, everybody's signing it. So I will be on tomorrow on Pop Culture Crisis, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. You guys can follow me on twitterminds.com at sarahpatchlitz as well as sarahpatchlitz.me. Somebody yes. asked, where's the video game? Oh. In production. Uh -huh. we, uh, we actually play it fairly often downstairs because the development version's available. And uh, it's, a, it's a collaboration with Seamus. So it's a, I guess it's a Freedom, Freedom Tunes video game, basically. It's, it's oh, all Freedom, Freedom Tunes style. style. Super dope. Yeah. And the story's amazing. And it's like passively political. But the character you play is not political. And it's like, I don't want to say too much. Maybe we'll come up with a marketing plan for what we can announce about the game and show. We, we've shown off some of it already on the vlog and on Instagram where it's like your little guy and you're, you know, in a skyscraper. So uh, it'll be fun. Anyway, thanks for uh, hanging out. Head over to TimCast.com. We'll see y'all uh, all over there in about an hour. And uh, thanks for hanging out. Bye, guys.